Chapter 13 Senate Building Trading on the ISE was suspended in the early hours of this morning, when Acting Chief of State Admiral Cha Niathal declared temporary martial law following the shock arrest of Cal Omas. A statement is expected in the Senate within the hour. Meanwhile, other galactic financial centers report brisk trading. KDYA shares closed 50.3 credits up on yesterday, and both Mandel Motors and Roche Industries ended the day up more than 30 credits. Market News Business Headlines Senator Gassell glanced at the holocams that transmitted Senate debates to every office, restaurant, and public area in the Senate building, then shook his head, eyes closed for a moment. Full house, he said. You'd better have a good speech ready, Cha, a really good one. Neathal adjusted her uniform and prepared to go out onto the Chief of State's platform to address the Senate. Things weren't playing out quite as she'd imagined, but then battles never did, and the political arena was as prone to the fog of war as any fleet engagement. Jason Solo, whom she expected to see strutting around the Senate, was keeping a low profile. But she'd see about that. If she was going to be shoved out front to tap dance for his coup, she'd make sure he was visibly part of their double act. She wasn't taking responsibility for this on her own. It's temporary. It's for the duration of the war, and no ordinary citizens will notice an adverse impact on their lives, she said, rehearsing her key messages. Play a bit of Omis's clandestine meeting footage, wave around the news on Mandalore and Roche, and everyone nods and says, Yes, indeed, Admiral, we live in dangerous times. Please do look after us as an interim government, while the Chief of State's office is thoroughly investigated. I like Jason, Gisil said, suddenly very quiet. But is he reliable these days? Reliable for what? I would never have authorized the Gedjin business. It was extreme. It's done. Corellia is wobbling a little, because their assorted lunatic fringes have given us a massive bonus by claiming they did it. But Thawi has been brought up short, because they probably think we did it, but can't believe we had the nerve. And, well, I never thought I'd live to say this, but those ghastly little Mandalorian savages have been wonderfully helpful. Cha, I don't want to worry you, but have you noticed their rearming? With Verpine Tech, too? I certainly have. Best news of the week. They must teach you something at Staff College that's beyond us lesser mortals. Neothel checked the chrono. She had ten minutes to psych herself up into appearing as a safe pair of hands, reluctant to take the burden of the reins of state, and anxious to hand them back as soon as the current unpleasant business was over. Yes, she meant that, too. She wanted the chief of state's post, but she wanted a genuine mandate to do it. And there was no better way to achieve that than to show she could be a responsible leader in this most extreme of situations. When she finally ran for office, the electorate would know her by her deeds. As long as I can keep Jason on a choke chain, of course, and he doesn't ruin it for me. If he gets out of hand, well, there's always Fett. Have you ever kept Nuna? she asked. Not in the apartment. I'm told they tend to form rival groups within the flock, and they can get very territorial. Squabbles break out. Now let wild boursas into the coop, and it's bedlam. They go into a killing frenzy. Grab as many Nuna to eat later as they can and escape. They don't care which group they eat. That's your Mandalorians. 
It's a lovely analogy, but it's lost on me. Forget strategy. Mandalorians don't care who wins. They just want to eat, drink, fight, and maintain their self-image. Giselle gave her a long, wary stare. You're the Supreme Commander. I assume you can assess a military risk. You want my assessment? Fett has no intention of expanding his small sphere of influence. Mandalorians might have been a mighty empire a few millennia ago, but they can't handle the difficult business of running a modern, complex democracy. They know it, so they just want to live their primitive warrior fantasy and revel in their reputation. Which is earned. I accept that they're phenomenal soldiers. They kicked out the Empire and the Yuzhan Vong, without any help from us. That still doesn't mean they want to dominate the galaxy. There are fewer than three million of them on Mandalore now, and they don't have anything like a government structure that could organize them well enough to take over the GA or the Confederation. They'll always be the Bursa let loose among Nuna. They're opportunistic feeders. But Fett's a smart, smart man. Forget the Wookiee braids. He wants to see Jason Solo fall a long way, Neothel said. I don't buy fostering galactic chaos just to get back at one man, even if it's Jason. No, we've created our own chaos. That's just the distraction act. Two minutes to go. Neofel sipped a glass of water and rolled her head to loosen her neck. There was nothing worse than a strained voice caused by tight muscles. She needed to sound relaxed, regretful, but authoritative. As long as he plays bogeyman, the G.A. holds together. Because the smaller planets are scared the Mandalorians will be back and they'll cling to us for protection. Or rush to the Confederation. Not if the Confederation buys Fett's arms and we don't. We can rob him of his neutrality, or at least the appearance of it. Gasil continued to look at her as if she'd arrived from beyond the Outer Rim. He was taking this coup, and she was happy to call it that in private, remarkably well. Given his position, she'd expected him to want a piece of the action. Gvli, will you run for the Chief of State's office in due course? Will there be a Chief of State? I fully intend to return to elections and civil rule once the war is over. Then no, I won't. I'm fine not being where Omus was. If a thing can happen once... It can happen twice. Gasil steered her toward the access to the floating platform. You need to watch your back with Jason. I know, she said. So I'm neutralizing him now. Start as you mean to go on. The word neutralize had several unfortunate meanings, and judging by the look on Gasil's face... He'd thought of the worst one. No, just tactically. Where is he, anyway? He probably had some fingers he needed to break. Let me worry about finding him later. Gasil followed her onto the platform. Here we go. Neafa looked down at her boots as she stepped onto the platform, and when she looked up, the sheer scale of the Senate chamber unsettled her for a split second. It was a blessing. She knew her genuine dismay would come across as humble reluctance. There was nothing worse for a new military dictator than looking too keen. For a chamber of thousands of delegates, even with the recent secessions and defections, it was remarkably quiet. Her platform drifted serenely into the center of the massive chamber. 
She was looking into lights and shadows, generally unable to see faces. It was, in so many senses, a theatrical stage complete with blinding footlights. Gentle beings, she began. Formal. Strictly formal was the best bet, she calculated. I never expected to be addressing you in this way, and I find myself barely prepared for it. I greatly regret the need to stand on this platform, but the need has arisen. It will be a need for the shortest period possible, and apart from the temporary leadership of the G.A., nothing else will change. I stress that. There is no curfew, no censorship, and none of the other trappings of martial law. Had Chief Omas been taken ill, I would be standing here anyway, and nobody would be panicking. What's happened overnight is no more constitutionally significant than that. I've merely exercised my responsibility as the Supreme Commander to deputize for the Chief of State, on the advice of the GA Security Services. As soon as the general security situation with the Confederation is resolved, and I expect that to be within the short term, I'll step down and will hold elections for the Chief's office. There wasn't a single lie in there. There was never any need to lie. She meant every word. There was simply information that the Senate didn't have. And everyone went through life with an incomplete picture of the galaxy anyway. One of the representatives for Kuat signaled to speak. When you refer to the Security Services, Admiral, do you mean Alliance Intel or the GAG? Neothel wondered if Gassil had engineered the question, because it was so perfectly on cue. I'd like to share some material with you, she said, so that you understand where the need to act arose. It was possibly contempt of court to show the images of Omis's meeting with Gedjin. Evidence like that would prejudice his chance of a fair trial. But she had a shrewd idea that Omis wouldn't be cleared by a jury, return to work with his reputation intact, and sue the G.A. for wrongful arrest. In his case, the arrest was verdict and sentence in one. She gestured for the images to be projected onto the viewing screen on each delegate's platform. It was gratifying to hear the faint exclamations of surprise as the scene played out, complete with Alliance Intel officers. Neothel displayed a little dignified pain at the moment of betrayal when Durgedjan discussed how to remove her and Jason from their posts. The silence that followed was perfect. So you'll understand why I felt I had to take advice from the GAG. Because Alliance Intel's objectivity may have been compromised by attendance at that meeting, she said. And while it's not illegal for two heads of state at war to have discussions... It's unacceptable for them to plan the removal of a Supreme Commander without consulting the Security and Intelligence Council. She hoped they noted that the chair of that council was sitting at her right hand. It was time for him to do his party piece. So she sat down and let Gassel have the floor. I've got very little to add, Gassel said, except to say that I'm saddened to come to this. A word about the presence of G.A. troops on the streets alongside C.S.F. officers. This is simply a precaution, in case the anarchic elements on Coruscant try to take advantage of the situation. As in any democracy, they have the right to exist and to speak. But if any of them attempt to capitalize on the situation— then the rule of law will be upheld. Well, there's no need for the anarchists to overthrow the government now, is there? said the delegate from Harun Khal. You got there first. 
With that in mind, the author continued, I intend to ask Colonel Jason Solo to act as joint chief of state with me. A matter of checks and balances, so that the temporary power doesn't rest with one person, and one can subject the other to scrutiny. She let the comment from Harun Kal pass. Nobody else picked up on it. By failing to invoke the full range of emergency restrictions she now had the right to impose, she felt she'd sent out a clear message that this really was a case of an embarrassed and reluctant military being hauled in to mind the shop because the civilian head of state had been a very naughty boy. It seemed to have worked. Either the Senate was collectively terrified, or it was ninety percent convinced, ten percent wary. She would settle for either. Gisele followed her back to her office. She sat down and felt the relief flood her. Next, said Gisele, and poured two cups of calf from the dispenser. We have a breathing space while the senators panic about their share prices and the Corellian administration flounders like beached daggers. Reopen the stock exchange, she said. I need to see the finance secretary at some point today to arrange for treasury intervention if the market panics again. I'm bringing Alliance Intel under GAG command and assigning Captain Gearden to that... Oh, classic. And I want Omis's office sealed until further notice. Gisele looked mildly surprised. You're not moving in there? I'm not. And neither is Jason. It smacks of enthusiasm for power, rather than necessary duty. We seal it as it stands, which is best practice in terms of allowing CSF to preserve a potential crime scene. She tapped the internal comm code for Senate building maintenance into her desk keypad. And nobody fights over whose chair it is. Gisele finally gave way to the smile that was trying to cross his face. And what an elegant way to neutralize Jason, should he hanker after power. Give it to him to start with. You don't need to know we did a deal. I don't like having opposing forces approaching from the rear, Gvli. I like them where I can see them. That's the first time I've heard you refer to Jason as opposing. We want the same outcomes, she said carefully, aware of how ephemeral alliances were in this game. Order, stability, and peace. I don't care for his methods, that's all. Once I managed to teach him that putting citizens in camps and killing prisoners is not the done thing, we'll get on just fine. You have to see the Jedi Council, too. I'll see Skywalker later, but not the rest of the armed mystics. Neophil paused and sent a message to Luke that she wanted to continue the good working relationship he'd had with Omus, and that he would be welcome for an informal discussion. She'd remain cautious, though, because they seemed to represent a third and unelected power, neither civilian nor military, and every time she looked at Jason Solo, she saw just what Jedi could turn into. This has been surprisingly civilized, Gisele said. The business of the chamber is going on as usual. No riots, no protests, no counter-revolution. It isn't lunchtime yet. Nevertheless, this is remarkable. And we have a war going on. Even if the Corellians are spinning their wheels at the moment... Bathawi isn't. I have crews out there on the front line. 
It was simply a statement of fact. She still wore a uniform, and whatever her ambitions, the service ethic was very nearly coded into her genes by now. She really did have a war to win and people to bring home alive. Oh, you're good, Gisil said, misreading her totally. You're very good. Stang, I might even vote for you on the strength of today's showing. That was the only way Neafel wanted to remain in this post. By election. It made it much easier to hang on to it than being a dictator. She was also an officer who liked her moral lines, her rules of engagement, completely clear. Within those, though, she believed in taking the battle to the enemy and pressing home every advantage. I look forward to it, she said. Jedi Council Chamber It had been a long night, and the morning's news left Luke reeling. He looked at Mara across the chamber, noted that her injuries were largely healed, and wondered when she was going to be ready to talk to him about what was making her grind her teeth in her sleep. Something had got to her, and the fact that she was silent and not raging about it worried him. It meant it was more than Lumia or Alima. Makes you wonder what tomorrow might bring, Kip said wearily, scratching his head with both hands as if he were shampooing his hair. A bombshell with every bulletin. I haven't always seen eye to eye with Omis, but I don't believe he's a security risk. Luke had never handled frustration well, and age hadn't mellowed that. He could see what was happening. He knew his history, and he had no love of military government. Nobody of his generation who'd grown up under the Empire did. So now we have two threats, an external war and an internal coup. Where do we concentrate our efforts? Well, Neathal is well within her rights to assume power under the circumstances, Corin said. So it's not exactly a coup— and much as we might not like it as citizens with a vote, as Jedi we have no business interfering in that. Can I say it? Kip asked. Because it's just staring us in the face and nobody's mentioning it. Go on. Jason! There, I said it. Jason, Jason, Jason! What in the name of the Force is going on here? Okay, maybe we should have taken him to task when he started kicking down doors with the G.A.G. Now, overnight, he's busted the chief of state and taken over. Extreme? Out of control, my friends. Has he actually declared himself joint chief of state? Personally? Silgal looked up. Admiral Neathal announced it. We've heard nothing from Jason. Then maybe it wasn't his idea. Luke looked at Mara to catch her eye, but she seemed in a world of her own. Mara? Sorry. She snapped to attention, blinking. I don't see Jason being dragged kicking and screaming to the big office somehow. Regardless of who came up with the idea, he's hardly rushed to decline the honor. He's gone to ground, said Kip. We've been through a whole twenty-four hours of news bulletins without seeing him. He must be chained up somewhere to keep him away from reporters. How would we know? Corin asked. He never talks to us, and he's holed up in his cozy G.A.G. bunker when he's not out harassing Corellians. Time I went to see him, said Luke. I mean really see him. Neothels sent a message saying she wants to maintain the good relationship between the Jedi Council and the Chief's office. I'm taking her up on that as soon as she can clear her schedule. Mara seemed to be concentrating on the proceedings again. If I didn't know Corellia was in dire straits over Gedjin's death, 
I'd have said it was an outside attempt to destabilize the GA. If he'd still been alive, they'd have moved in on us by now. It was an interesting thought that suddenly got more interesting in Luke's mind as he rolled it around. Mara could always spot the issue. The two events might have been coincidental, or they might not. But the assassination was tied up with the removal of Omus, and not only because he'd been meeting the Corellian shortly before he died. The crazier news programs were speculating wildly that Omus had been directly involved in the assassination. But Luke felt that something more convoluted was happening, and judging by the grinding cog's expression on her face, Mara did too. She wasn't quite talking to herself, but her lips moved occasionally, involuntarily, as she stared into the mid-distance. You used to talk everything through with me, Mara. What happened? You know what, Kip said, we're missing an important point. As Jedi, either we're players in GA politics, or we're another instrument of the elected leadership like the fleet. If we're the latter, then we might have our opinions, but we do as the legitimate leadership directs. If we're not, then we've got no more right to start interfering with the status quo than the monster raving anarchist party. Jason might be completely off the charts now, but he's not acting as a Jedi. He's an officer in the security forces who happens to be a Jedi. When my front doors come crashing in with a G.A.G. boot, Corin said, that's going to make me feel so much better. Kip twisted around in his seat to jab a finger in Corin's direction. I'm not saying we shouldn't act, just that we need to be clear where we stand. And the Athel and Jason are within their rights. There's rights, said Mara, and there's right. Kip raised an eyebrow. And the semantics thought for the day was brought to you by our sponsors. I'm seeing the Athel said Luke, slapping his palm down on the arm of his chair. I should have gone with my gut so long ago. I really did take my eye off the ball trying to live up to this role. And before we start griping about lack of action, think about this. When it was a matter of your not approving of Ben's involvement with the GAG, it was a choice between letting him carry on and hauling a teenage boy home. Now we're talking about action against... What, exactly? Stage our own coup? Depose Neofel? Confiscate Jason's lightsaber? I'm up for most things, I admit, but we have to think this through, because we might leave matters worse than before we started. Well, trying to talk him around is off the menu, said Mara. So I'm sticking with going after the irritant in this. Lumia. But let's not forget that Omis didn't exactly behave sensibly, and the awful isn't in Lumia's thrall. She's got her own agenda, and I don't get any sense of the dark side influencing that. Luke knew she was right. The dynamics were complex. The best thing Jedi could do was to tackle the things that non-Force users couldn't. Once again, he missed the clarity of thoroughly evil adversaries, or at least those he thought were evil. It was hard to turn against your allies. It was as hard as turning against your own family. Now they were one and the same. G.A.G. Headquarters, Coruscant The worst thing about waking up that morning was the few seconds of blank comfort before remembering what had happened. And then the world collapsed again. Ben couldn't stop seeing Jory LeCouf everywhere he looked. He couldn't face staying at home. He needed the company of his friends, the people who missed LeCouf too. As he walked through the GAG security gates, and the system accepted his identicard to open the blast-proof doors, 
Every face in the corridor was Lakoff's. When Ben went into the locker room, he could hear his voice. It was a running nightmare conjured up by a combination of his four senses and the simple human reaction to fresh bereavement. He wanted it to stop, but he felt he was being disloyal to a dead friend for wanting not to see him everywhere. Xavier was still in the monitoring room. He looked up at Ben and tapped the mute button on his earpiece. You okay? Fine. I won't say it. Fine. And not your fault, okay? Could have been any one of us. Zavirk tapped the button again and dragged the adjacent chair closer for Ben to sit down. You heard that the boss is... Well, really the boss now? Yeah. Should be good news for us. Ben knew that his father would say it wasn't good news at all. He sat in the monitoring room for a while, just grateful to be among the troopers, and then wandered off to find a quiet spot. If he couldn't handle this kind of stuff without being devastated, he'd be no use in the GAG. Every other trooper here got on with it. Chevu had probably had an awful conversation with Lakauf's parents, but when Ben walked by his office, he was hard at work, marking up a duty roster on the wall and getting on with things. Okay, I'm fourteen. I could say, all right, I'm just a kid, and I don't have to be tough when my buddies get killed, but I can't pick and choose when I act like an adult. I've got to get on with it, or go to school like every other kid my age and he was scaring his mother. She had enough problems of her own hunting Lumia. According to the roster display, Jason was on duty. The time codes showed he'd been at HQ since about one in the morning. Ben couldn't feel his presence, but that didn't surprise him now. There was a time when Jason had hidden in the force when he had to. Now he only showed himself when he seemed to feel it was necessary. Without thinking about it, Ben found himself shutting down, too. As he walked down the corridor, the tiles still gleaming with spots of water because the cleaning droids were just meters ahead of him, he let himself merge with the matter and energy around him. The more he did it, the less he felt like he was in a trance, cut off from reality, and the more he felt like he was observing the world as it truly was particles within particles. It gave him a fleeting feeling of serene clarity. It was relief of a kind. At the top of the corridor, a pair of doors led to the holding cells. That area was always kept shut, but today there was a notice fixed on the wall next to it that read, Top-Level Clearances Only. They were holding Chief Omis down there. It seemed surreal. Ben carried on toward Jason's office, and he could see as he rounded the corner that the doors were open. As usual, he couldn't feel Jason's presence, but he could hear him talking to someone. Who is it? Odd. I can't feel anybody else. Jason might have been on his comlink, but his tone of voice wasn't that slightly stilted, self-conscious one that he tended to lapse into when he couldn't see who he was speaking to. In fact, he sounded as if he was trying to keep his temper. You overplayed your hand, said Jason. You worry too much, said a woman's voice. That was the point at which Ben realized something was very wrong. Only a Jedi could be there and not be sensed, or a Yuzhan Vong and they weren't exactly frequent visitors to the GAGHQ. And the voice was somehow familiar, even though he couldn't place it. It was dishonest to sneak up on his commanding officer, on his cousin, his mentor, but it seemed like the only sensible thing to do. Keeping himself hidden in the Force, 
Ben edged silently along the corridor and stood as close to the open doors as he could. This wing of the headquarters building was deserted, and Jason probably relied on sensing people coming and going. He thought he and his guest were alone. You cut it too fine, Jason was saying. There's being a decoy, and there's being too clever, and you crossed that line. Are you recovered now? Yes, said the woman's voice. It had that slightly husky edge to it, like she used too many death sticks. But it worked. It gave you the space to act without having her crawling all over your operation. She really thinks I want revenge for some daughter. I sometimes think your cover stories are too complex. And mind-rubbing Ben about Nelani isn't? Ben recoiled. It was all he could do not to storm in. Jason, you did that? He wouldn't understand why I had to do it, said Jason. And that's why he can't ever be your apprentice. Get rid of him. Find another one and stop wasting your time. Now there's my real problem. I can't help you there. Whoever it turns out to be, that's the force's decision— You'll know very soon. Well, I dealt with Omis anyway. A clear path. Are you going to keep him here? I thought house arrest might be more sensible in the long term. Republica House is easy to secure, and it makes us look like the good guys. People still like Omis. And here you are. Joint Chief of State. That way Neothel thinks she can keep me quiet. Or under control. She's way too smart. Play nicely with her. You need her to keep the military behind you. You're such a strategist, Lumia. Lumia? Lumia? Ben thought he'd misheard, or that his state of mind was making him hear what he wanted to hear, like LeCouf's voice. But he knew what he'd heard, and his first reaction wasn't one of fear or dread, but agonized embarrassment. He'd trusted Jason, and Jason had lied to him. He'd mind-rubbed him, and they were talking about him as if he was in the way. The fact that Jason was knowingly talking to a Sith as if they were old friends seemed to take second place to that. For all his denial, Jason knew Lumia, and she could walk into G.A.G.H.Q. and just talk to him. Jason wasn't being conned by her. He was chatting casually with her about what he'd do next. Ben found himself scrabbling for excuses that would explain why Jason could be meeting with Lumia and still be someone he could trust, someone with a perfectly good reason for it all. Jason's a Jedi. He can't be in league with her. She's done something to him. Mind influenced him or something. This woman had left his mother with a battered face. This woman was all he'd been taught to fear and avoid, and Jason was talking to her in his office as bold as anything. Ben knew he had to tell someone, but he'd run out of people to trust. If Jason could be influenced like that, anyone could. Except Mom. Mom wasn't in Lumia's thrall, or she wouldn't have been in a fight with her. Ben had to find her. He had to warn her. That morning he'd felt like things couldn't possibly get any worse. And now he knew they could. Chapter 14 
If you think you're going to scare us off by cozying up to the Mandalorians, bug boy, you've got another think coming. Heban del Dalle, Mercan in Department of Trade and Industry, to the Roche Ambassador during a disagreement on intellectual property rights. Bevin Vasser Farm, Keldabe, Mandalore. Too much hollow news is bad for you said the man standing in the doorway of the outbuilding. Fat had spotted him coming. It was hard not to. His armor was extraordinary. There was no real need for Fett to be vigilant on Mandalore. But then Jaster Mareel had once thought he was perfectly okay among his own people, too. Safe was always better than sorry. Fett carried on cleaning his helmet, feet up on the chair. It's riveting he said, nodding in the direction of the monitor that he'd propped on the table. The news anchors and commentators had descended into a feeding frenzy about the bloodless coup. Jason Solo, the boy who wants to be Vader when he grows up. He finally did it. He probably looks in the mirror when he brushes his teeth and tells himself it's his destiny. And you are... Venku. He didn't have a proper Keldabe accent. If anything, he sounded like he'd spent time on Kuat, and maybe Munalinst, too. That wasn't unusual for Mandalorians, and it was more common now that so many were flooding back to what Bevin called Mandayayim. That was the traditional name for the planet, not Mandalore. Fett had never realized that. Every day was an education that told him how far adrift he was from his own people. Sit down, Venku. Fett gestured to the last remaining chair in the room. He tried to think leader, and not bounty hunter. Whatever it is, get it off your chest. Venku had the most eclectic armor Fett had ever seen. It was accustomed to wear sections of armor belonging to a dead relative or friend. But Venku had no two plates that matched. Every piece was a different color. The palette ranged from blue, white, and black to gold, cream, gray, and red. What happened to your fashion sense? Did someone shoot it? Venku still stood, ignoring the chair. He glanced down at his plates as if noticing them for the first time. The chest plate, the boucher, and shoulder sections came from my uncles. The forearm plates were my father's. The thigh plates came from my cousin, and the belt was my aunt's. Then there's... Okay. Big family. Those who are Tabechajla, and those who still live, yes. Fett had given up asking for translations. He got the general idea. I'm nearly done with cleaning my bucket. And they said charm wasn't your strong suit. Okay. I came to tell you I'm relieved you decided to be a proper Mandalore. The Mandoade are coming home. You probably don't notice much beyond your own existence. But this is your purpose. Fett had never thought of himself as easygoing, but normally he couldn't get worked up enough to slug fools if he wasn't paid to. This man didn't strike him as a fool, but he'd hit a nerve, and Fett couldn't quite work out why. Glad I could be more useful than a doorstop. Which is why I'm also relieved to give you this. Venku opened a pouch on his ammunition belt, his aunt's belt, he'd said, so she must have been a typical Mondo woman, and placed a small, dark blue rectangular container on the table. And don't mistake this for adulation or sentimentality. You owe your people. There will be someone along shortly to administer it. Venku turned toward the door as the word administer bored into Fett's skull. Whoa there! Venku glanced over his multicolored shoulder. Don't try doing it yourself. It has to be inserted into the bone marrow, 
and that's going to hurt like you wouldn't believe. Let someone qualified do it. It'll still hurt, but they'll place it correctly. So this was one of Jang's minions. He certainly didn't have his boss's sartorial style, although he did have expensive dark green leather gloves, and Fett couldn't guess what or who had contributed to those. Tell him we're even, Fett said, and thank him. Venku started to say something, then stopped as if he was getting a message via his helmet. Fett tilted his own helmet in his lap so he could see the HUD display that was patched into Slave One's external security cam. A man tottered past the ship, clearly very old indeed from his gait, but still wearing full fighting armor, and paused to look at the ship. Then he moved out of cam range in the direction of the building. Fett would never rule out even a senile Mandalorian as a possible threat. If the old man had survived to that age, he was either unusually lucky or a serious fighter. But Fett remained with his feet on the chair, wiping the red shimmer silk lining of his helmet with a sapon cloth, consumed with curiosity, but hiding it perfectly. The old man appeared in the doorway, squeezed past Venku, and stared at Fett. At least I lived to see the day, he said. Sukui Mandalor Gar Shabuir. It wasn't the most polite greeting that Fett had ever received, but it was certainly the most relevant to a terminally ill man. It was the only possible way that warriors and mercenaries could greet each other. So you're still alive. He'd worked out what Shabuir meant, too, but he chose to take it as ribald affection rather than abuse. The old Mondo walked out with arthritic dignity paused again at the door to stare at Fett, and went on his way. "'You made his day,' said Venku. "'I shouldn't ask.' "'Then don't!' Venku sighed, then put his hands to his helmet to pop the seal. The rustle of fabric muffled his voice as he lifted the boucher. "'Oh, all right, then!' Boba Fett was looking into the face of a man perhaps ten or fifteen years younger than him. Dark hair with a liberal threading of gray, strong cheekbones, and the very darkest brown eyes. He'd looked much like that himself twenty years ago. The nose was sharper, and the mouth was a stranger's, but the rest... It was a Fett face. He was looking into his own eyes and into the eyes of his long-dead father. "'I'm Venku,' said the Mondo with the motley armor. "'But you probably know me better as Kataka. "'Interesting to meet you at last, Uncle Boba.' Osarian Tapcalf, Coruscant "'I couldn't think who else to tell,' Ben said. Or who else would listen to me if I did? Mara wondered if he'd been crying about Lakauf or Jason's breathtaking betrayal. He'd been crying about something, though, and he was doing a reasonable job of disguising it. I believe you, Ben. Maybe I did imagine it. You didn't. No, he certainly couldn't imagine Lumia having a friendly chat with Jason dissecting their run of triumphs and deciding when Neathal would no longer be useful. And discussing their lies. No daughter to avenge, and wiping out Ben's memory of what happened to Nelani. Ben had the useful ability to recall things he'd seen or heard with nearly complete accuracy. Mara's scalp had tightened and tingled, as she heard her son, her precious kid, relating the exact words of that Sith cyborg and her accomplice, like an innocent possessed by a demon. 
accomplice. Mara realized she'd shifted her position by a few parsecs. Not a vain, conceited, naive victim of a manipulative Sith. An accomplice. Jason wasn't weak-minded enough to fall that far and that fast unless he wanted to. I haven't told anyone else, and I don't want to, Ben whispered. Not Dad, either. I mean, you can tell him if you really think he needs to know, Mom, but I don't want to see the look on his face when he finds out what a moron I've been. But I defended Jason. When did I get stupid? No more of a moron than the rest of us, sweetheart. What are we going to do? I won't ask you to do anything. Mara had let her drink get cold. She couldn't swallow it anyway, even if it hadn't tasted like the Millennium Falcon's hydraulic overflow, because her throat was tight with rage. Ben, you have a choice. I told Jason that Lumia was trying to kill you, and he was all innocence. So you knew about Zeost, then? No, I don't know anything about Zeost. But you're going to tell me. Ben's face fell. She had to gather what intel she could. But it was also good for Ben to learn that it was all too easy to give away information accidentally. Just the word Zeost made all the pieces start to fall into agonizing place. Jason sent me on a mission to Almania to recover an amulet that had some dark side power. I ended up on Zeost, and a ship attacked me, but I found a really weird vessel and got away. Just like that. It wasn't Lumia, actually. It was a Bothan. And how did you find this ship? Mara was trying to work out the scam. She knew what she'd done to Lumia's ship, and that the transponder was now showing it was stationary on Coruscant. If the last thirty-six hours hadn't been total mayhem, she'd have paid her another visit by now. Just parked? Hatch open with the key in the drive? It... Look, I'm not insane, but it spoke to me. Oh... Mara had enough pieces in the puzzle now to see the rough shape of the picture that would emerge. Spherical, orange, like a big eye. Ben's face drained completely of color. Yes. Tell me about it. He struggled visibly with something. Mara guessed he'd been sworn to secrecy. It was way too late for all that loyalty bunk. I've seen the ship, Ben. It spoke to me, too. It said it thought I was the other one like me. And I thought it had mistaken me for Lumia. But it meant you, didn't it? Somehow it picked up on our similarities. Ben gulped in air, as if the relief of being able to share the awful experience were saving him from drowning. I worked out how to pilot it, it communicates through the Force. And it's soaked in dark energies. I know. Go on. I don't know how it works, but if you visualize what you want it to do, it does it. It sticks out parts of itself and forms them into cannons, all kinds of weapons. Perfect. Perfect. Mara was getting a better picture by the second. Lumia could think at the ship, and it had rushed to do her bidding. Maybe even extrude a cable, whip it around Mara, drag her away, and nearly throttle her. It wasn't a droid. I got bushwhacked by a living ship. A Sith ship. That old, cold clarity and pitiless sense of purpose flooded Mara's body. And instead of making her gut churn as any mother's might at hearing the kind of risk her son had been subjected to, 
It settled her into a calm and rational state close to transcendence. She was the hand again, planning her move. So what happened to the ship between the time you found it and when I came across it the other day? Where did you see it? Hesperidium? When I caught up with Lumia? Ben's shoulders sagged. He folded his arms on the table and lowered his head onto them. Mara waited, stroking his hair, because she assumed he was crying again. He straightened up, face stricken but eyes dry. I flew it back to the Anakin Solo and handed it over to Jason. Everything fell into place. The only pieces missing now were how she would put an end to this. But that was her specialty, and it could wait a while until she'd made sure Ben was safe. Okay, I think you know how serious this is, she said. Their heads were almost touching over the table. To the Osarians who used the restaurant and who spoke very little basic, they probably looked like mother and son having a tearful argument over homework and poor grades. They would never have guessed that it was about the fate of the galaxy. No, it's not about the galaxy. Enough of the galaxy. The galaxy can look after its own problems for a while. This is about my child. My only child. And some Sith scum trying to kill him, while his own cousin, my own nephew, who should be looking after him, helps her do it. It all became very clear and simple from that moment onward. Ben, will you accept a suggestion from me? Anything, Mom. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Hey, I'm the one who should be sorry. I trusted a monster. I shouted down my husband. I ignored every single sign that Jason was trouble. But you're in real danger, and it's going to be more than you can handle. So I want you to be very cautious. I want you to behave like a coward for a change. Take no risks. In fact, I'd like you to report in sick and get as far away from Jason as you can until I get this fixed. Ben nodded, grim. Very old eyes in a terribly young face. He really was just a kid, even if he behaved like a man now. Mara was instantly so proud of him, and so fiercely protective at the same time, that the only cogent emotion she could identify was the instinct to seek out and kill whatever threatened him. She could do that. It was her calling. I'll do it carefully, he said, so Jason doesn't realize I've found out that Lumia is making him do all this. Oh, sure she is. That's right, sweetheart. I promise I won't hide in the force from you, but I might have to do it to hide from her, or even Jason, if she's got him so far under her control that he's taken over the government. Sometimes you had to hear someone else say it to believe it. Tell you what, said Mara, smiling. Why don't you show me how you do it? Then maybe I'll get a better sense of when you're just hiding and when to worry. Ben nodded, eyes downcast. There would be no holds barred now. Mara would use every means and weapon at her disposal and there would be an end to this. They spent the rest of the day doing something that they hadn't done in a very long time, just wandering around the Sky Dome Botanical Gardens, talking and having fun, or as much fun as could be had with a galactic civil war in progress and a military junta running the GA. The only evidence of the huge upheaval was that the CSF officer on patrol in the plaza had a Galactic Alliance Defense Force sergeant walking the beat with him. 
Apart from that, nobody seemed troubled. Mara wondered if all cataclysmic events in history were noticed only by a handful. Like Ben had said, prophetically, over lunch only days before, perhaps it had been that way during the Empire, too, and most people's lives were the same under Palpatine as they had been under the Republic. She didn't want to think it was true. Luke certainly didn't. Come on, Mom, Ben said. Let's go find a nice spot on the lawns, and I'll teach you how to vanish. They said it was a sure sign of imminent old age when your kids could teach you things. It was a simple thing, hiding in the force, but then so was dieting, and not many people could knuckle down to that and make it work either. Ben was a remarkably patient teacher. After a couple of hours, she could manage a minute or two without needing to grab something solid. I'm sorry about Lecalf, she said, putting her arm around him as they walked. I'm sorry I wasn't very kind to him. Sounds like he was one of the best. He did it to make sure I got away. How do I live with that kind of sacrifice, Mom? By making your life count, I think, so that his wasn't wasted. It was the closest she'd ever felt to Ben, and probably the first time they'd really related as adults. It left her feeling profoundly happy. The irony wasn't lost on her that it was in the midst of some of the worst events and greatest threats they'd ever faced. Times like this made you painfully aware of what truly mattered. Ben, you're probably going to see a side of me soon that isn't good old mom. He smelled wonderfully of that indeterminable Benness that she had enjoyed when he was tiny, and that was still there under the scent of military-issue soap and weapon lubricant. But I want you to know that whatever I do, However much of a stranger you think I become, I love you, and you're my heart, every fiber of it. Nothing matters to me more than you. She stopped to hug him, and he hugged her back rather than just submitting to the indignity as he usually did. It went on for a while. You know why I believe you, Mom? Because you didn't tell me to trust you. Everyone else tells me to trust them, and that's usually the cue that I shouldn't. Mara got another glimpse of the man her son would be, and the mother she'd been so far. It hadn't worked out so badly after all. She knew only too well what the stakes were now, and what she had to do. Jason Solo's Apartment, Coruscant Ben? Jason looked around the apartment, but there was no sign of his young cousin. He'd probably gone back to see his parents. He still needed reassurance about the dark necessity in life, passing through that stage between being oblivious of consequences with the careless cruelty of a child, and the more sensitive but responsible acceptance that life dealt harsh and unavoidable hands to many. At the moment, Ben both felt too much and had too little life experience to handle the pain. Jason looked through the contents of the conservator and decided to order a delivery from a restaurant instead. There was a pattern now, he realized, and it was becoming less of his making. He'd put the pieces in place. The force had responded, and now it was his turn to make choices when it offered them. It was a dialogue. Lecauf was part of the pattern, too. But Jason was still working out why it hadn't been Ben who'd died. He'd almost been sure that was the way it would end. So I thought my destiny would let me off the hook with him. It won't. 
Jason Com linked an order for a three-course Toydarian low-fat banquet and ran a tub of hot foaming water in the refresher. The steam condensed on the mirrored wall, and he found himself writing in the haze with his fingertip. He will immortalize his love. It still didn't make sense. If it meant killing the person he loved most, as Lumia said, then there was no question. He would have given his life for Alana. But at every turn in the last few months, he'd ended up protecting her. You'll know when it happens. Lumia was certain of that, and Jason believed it too. Immortalize, make immortal, write into history, make permanent. Why not just kill? Maybe I translated the tassel wrong. People read holozines in the tub to relax, but Jason found himself behaving like a bachelor slob and eating his takeout banquet. He was exhausted. He had the feeling he was coming to the peak of a wave, struggling up the gradient, and that when he hit the crest, that final hurdle to his Sith destiny, things would ease and make sense. Jason laid his fork on the edge of the tub and overwrote the prophecy again in the condensation. He will immortalize his love. Killing what you loved was the ultimate act of obedience and submission to higher duty. He'd seen a feature on the Hala channels about a tribe, couldn't recall which, where, when, who trained their elite troops by giving them a new Sito pup when they entered the cadet program. They were encouraged to bond with the pup, to race it against other cadets' new Sitos, and to generally learn to love it. Then, before the cadet could graduate, he was ordered to strangle his pup. If he couldn't or wouldn't, he was kicked out. He had to be able to put duty before emotion. That's me. That's what I have to do. Full of too much Toydarian sour fry, tired and lulled by hot water, Jason let his mind wander, and reached out in the forest to touch Alana and Tenelka. He risked this with decreasing frequency now. The latest attempt on their lives had been a stark warning of how precarious his family's position was. He'd never heard Alana call him Daddy. He probably never would. My family... Yes, that's who my family is. Not Jaina, not Mom, not Dad. My little girl and her mother. Trust me to fall for a woman whose customs prevent her ever naming the father of her child. He could have sworn Alana reached back at him. He was so thrilled that he opened his eyes and then realized that it was one more chance for someone to find her and harm her. Lumia wasn't above that. It was the Sith way. Making someone suffer and hate only strengthened their Sith powers. He'd visit Tenelka as soon as he was certain that he and Neothel had consolidated the takeover and that the war would be fought more logically and with less regard for keeping insignificant worlds happy. Got to deal with the Bothans next. Lumia can earn her keep again. But he couldn't keep his eyes open. He wasn't dozing, but Force visions wouldn't leave him alone. It was as if the Force was shaking him by the shoulders and telling him to pay attention and get on with it, because time was running out. Each time he closed his eyes, he saw the trust that Ben placed in him, and the lies he'd told the boy, and the danger he'd put him in. And Ben still kept coming back for more. He was desperate to do the right thing. Now Jason saw him clearly, head in his hands, sobbing. 
It's too high a price. What was? Le Kauf? No, there'd be many, many Le Kaufs. Wars were full of them. It was one reason why Jason had to put an end to the fighting, any way he could. Maybe it wasn't Ben, but about him. Why have I thought this over so many times? Why is it obsessing me? Because I'm denying it. Because I can't accept it's him. Because it has to be him. It would be easy to kill Ben. Because Ben trusted him. Jason knew how bad that would make him feel. It was strangling a Nusito pup. You don't want to see the inevitable, do you? Jason dried himself and spent the rest of the evening assembling his personal armory. He examined his lightsaber and blaster and knew that those still wouldn't be enough when Luke and Mara came after him to exact vengeance for Ben. He took out the box of assorted poisons and pathogens that could be delivered by dart or projectile, yet another range of weapons that might make it past the defenses of his most persistent enemies. He had all the bases covered, chemical, biological, mechanical. He just wanted it all over with. And when Ben was gone, who would be his apprentice then? Just before he fell asleep, it crossed his mind that Admiral Cha Niathal had demonstrated an excellent grasp of the Rule of Two. It was just as well she wasn't a Force user. Chapter 15 This has to be about more than getting tough on chaos and disorder. I need to be tough on the causes— of chaos and disorder, greed, corruption, and ambition. Jason Solo, Joint GA Chief of State, speaking at a lunch for the heads of Coruscanti Industry. Bevin Vassar Farm, Mandalore. Myrta put her finger to her lips, and the four of them stacked around the door as if getting ready to storm Fett's stronghold. I'll check, she said to Orade. Bevin winked at her. Medrit just kept glancing at his chrono, as if he didn't have time for all this. You can hide behind me if you like. Orade licked his lips nervously. Sharika, when Fett says he'll break my legs, he's just looking for an excuse. He's a sick man, Guess, and if you tell anyone— I'll be the one doing the breaking. Guess Orade would have faced a cannoned-up Chiss fleet armed only with a sharp stick and laughed about his chances of survival. But he was scared stiff of her grandfather. Myrta wondered if she was doomed to have all her romances doused liberally with freezing water because everyone now knew she was a fet. She leaned on the barn door. The building had been a drying shed and two indignant faces turned to her. "'What are you doing to him?' she demanded. "'Has he had a relapse or something?' Fett was breathing hard, as if he was in a lot of pain, hands clenched against his chest, face white and waxy. A woman she'd never seen before stood over him, holding a large-born needle-tipped syringe up to the light and checking the reservoir. Another man in a rag bag of assorted armor was standing with his back to the door. He didn't turn around. Jang kept his promise, Fett said, breathless. Or he's having the last laugh and poisoning me. We'll see. There's a slower and less painful way of getting this where it needs to go said the woman, flicking the syringe with her finger to clear air bubbles. But there's no point messing around, given the state you're in, Mandalore. 
direct into your bone marrow. Two shots to go. Just do it. He took his hands off his chest and parted his shirt. Myrta was surprised how bony he was. He looked such a fit, strong man in full armor. She never wanted anyone else to see him like this. Is this the best Mandalore can offer me? A veterinarian who spends her working day with her arm up up? Believe me, I prefer treating nerfs. Keep still, or I'll miss and puncture a lung, or worse. How long is this going to take? Mandalore, do you know what the alternative site to the sternum is for this treatment? Amaze me! The pelvic bones. Fett's expression was predictably blank, and he didn't say another word. He looked away, and anyone else would have thought it was casual annoyance at having his schedule interrupted. But Myrta knew him well enough by now to see he was in excruciating pain. She took the risk of stepping forward and folding her hand around his. He took it, too. She thought he'd break every bone in her fingers when the vet lined up the needle, so big that Myrta could see the hole in the tip, and pressed it hard into his breastbone, as if she were preparing a nuna for roasting. There was an awful squelch. Orade swallowed loudly. If you're going to faint or throw up, son, go do it outside, the vet said irritably. Failing that, find some analgesics. Where do you keep them? Forget it, Fett said. I need to know if you're doing me any damage. It's okay, Babuir, Myrta whispered. You'll be okay. If the Sarlacc didn't finish me off, she won't either. The vet, all smiling menace, inserted the syringe in a glass vial to refill. Last one. Shut your eyes and think of Mandalore. Myrta glanced over her shoulder at the man in the multicolored armor. He slipped off his helmet. Just making sure he doesn't die before he does something useful for Mandayayim, said the man. If it works, and it should, then he'll start to show signs of recovery in a few days. He looked a lot like Fett, and Jang, and the resemblance was unsettling. The Kifar part of her, the one that cared about bloodlines, told her this was her kin. Clones got around a bit during the war. She probably had a lot more genetic relatives than she'd first thought. Fett crushed Myrta's fingers again and didn't make a sound. The vet straightened up and opened a bottle of pungent-smelling liquid to clean her hands. Normally, I swat my patients across the rump and let them get on with grazing. But seeing as it's you, I'll skip that and suggest you take it easy for a day or so. Expect a big bruise. Fett gave her a silent nod of acknowledgment as she left, and fastened his undershirt. Then he looked up at Myrta. Say hello to your uncle Venku. He indicated the man in the motley armor, who still hadn't acknowledged her. Alias Kadika. It was all making sense now. Kadika had to be the son of a clone trooper. There must have been a lot of them out there and she wondered how many of them had any social graces or senses of humor, or if they all took after Babuir. Just doing my bit for Mandalorian unity, Venku said, slipping his helmet back on as if her close inspection was making him uncomfortable. Wouldn't do for the Mandalore to snuff it, just when we're on the rise again. He leaned over, Fett, and put two fingers against the pulse in his neck. 
Myrta expected her grandfather to flatten him for daring to lay hands on him, but he simply looked at the assorted plates of Beskar Gam with idle curiosity and tolerated the examination. Your heart rate's up, Venku said. Get some rest. Field medic. Yeah, they say I have a healing touch. Myrta found that hard to believe. Venku straightened up. Any problems, tell the folks at C. Carton's Tap Calf in town. They'll know how to contact me. Venku made for the door. As he brushed past her, he stopped and tapped his finger against the heart of fire dangling from her neck. He obviously never worried about getting a punch in the face. Interesting, he said. He was a chancer, a man who could obtain things, and obviously information as well. It was worth a try. It's a heart of fire, she said. It belonged to my grandmother. I need a full-blooded kifar to help me read the memories imprinted in it. He paused for a few moments. Mondoade come from all kinds of places— if I find anyone who can read the stone, I'll let you know. Then he was gone. Orade nudged Bevin. Go on, Orade said. Tell him. It'll make him happy. Okay, happier. Happy people heal faster. Fett put his armor plates back on. What's going to make me happy? Bevin had the beatific smile of a man who'd finished laying up stores for the winter and just enjoyed a big meal. Yomaget's got something to show you, Fett grunted. He was the least expressive man Myrton knew, but he seemed vaguely disappointed. He's got the Besu Leak Spaceworthy, has he? Bang goes the surprise. It's the thought that counts. He stood up and was instantly transformed from her sick babuir into Boba Fett, ruthless and relentless. But he didn't stride out the door right away. She took a guess that he was feeling the effects of the treatment and wasn't going to admit it, not even in front of people who knew exactly what was wrong. Where is it? She gestured to the ceiling and offered him her arm. Myrta was still looking for a reason not to hate Fett, and she was ready to look pretty deeply. She decided she could start by loving him for his sheer guts. Nothing fazed him, nothing stopped him, and nothing made him feel sorry for himself. They stood outside the barn and waited in silence. It looked like a tiny hut set against Slave One, laid up in her horizontal mode nearby. A low rumble interrupted the rural peace. Fett looked up as a dull black wedge shot across the sky and vanished behind a forested hill. Myrta lost it, but then it circled back again, came to a dead halt in midair about two hundred meters above them, and descended smoothly on burners. It landed on its blunt tail section and then extended struts to tilt through ninety degrees and come to rest horizontally like a conventional starfighter. The canopy lifted, and Yomaget climbed out, slid onto the ground, and kissed the matte fuselage. Sharika, he said to the ship, running a tender hand over the skin. I think I'm in love. Nice, said Fett. Puts the Ulik in Besulik. Yeah. I can see it's a beast. What's different? We applied the micronized Beskar skin, Mandalore. She's a toughened shabu ear now. Care to show her to the Verpine? It'd get their attention. If they share their Ultramesh technology with us, we might be able to lighten the airframe and improve her top end in atmosphere. 
if we skin her completely in solid Beskar, she's going to be invulnerable, but heavy. We'll keep the heavy ones. Maybe the Verpine can come up with a better fuel solution. Well, if you're not going to take her for a spin, I will, said Medrit. He scrambled up onto the wing and eased himself into the cockpit, looking as if he would fill it. Shab, a Mondo Verpine assault fighter. That'll cause some sleepless nights on Coruscant. If we can mine and process the ore fast enough. Yomaget looked hopeful. We could ask those helpful insectoid chaps to lend us an orbital facility or two. I'll go see them, Fett said. Got to think long term on this. No point handing over too much to Roche early in the game. Medrit spent the next hour taking the prototype Besulik through its paces over the Keldabe countryside, while the rest of them watched. Yomaget captured the aerobatics on his holorecorder, looking satisfied. Might slip this hologram out to a few contacts, he said. We're not a modest people, are we? Remind them that most of our adult population can fly a fighter, too, Fett said. For starters. He went back inside the barn. He didn't manage a smile, but Bevin turned to Myrta and cocked his head. Believe it or not, that's a happy man. Maybe he was a better judge of mood than she was. She was relieved just to hear Fett use the phrase long term. Times were changing. The rest of the galaxy might have been tearing itself apart, but the Mandalore sector, which now informally controlled Roche, if a protectorate agreement counted, was a haven of optimism after a decade or more of grim existence. That night, Myrta found the Oyubat tapcalf packed with new faces, and the singing was raucous. If Jason Solo, her mother's murderer, had been roasting slowly over the Oyubat's open fire instead of the side of Nerf, Myrta might even have joined in. Senate Building, Coruscant Jason's official airspeeder brought him up to the main Senate entrance. He could have entered the building by any number of more private platforms, but he had no intention of sneaking in via the back doors. Being seen counted for a lot, and he still had his heroic image to protect. A line of citizens waited outside the doors that admitted members of the public to the viewing galleries. Some just wanted to watch the day's business, but there was a small group who were clearly protesters. It wasn't just the free Omis banner that three of them were carrying among them. There was a taste of anger in the force, vivid despite the permanent background of fear and uncertainty. Drop me here, Jason said. I'll walk. They'll harass you, sir, said the grand chauffeur. I ought to take you straight up to your floor. They've got a right to see who's governing them. It wasn't as if they could cause him any harm. I find that talking to people generally clears up misunderstandings. Jason had expected at least one mass protest or a riot broken up by water cannon and dispersal gas. GAG intelligence showed that Corellian agents still operating on Coruscant were doing their best to make that happen but the general willingness of the population to accept the change of regime surprised him. The stock exchange had suspended trading for a few hours, and some shares had bounced around, but the traffic still flowed. The stores were full of food, holonet programming was uninterrupted, and everyone was getting paid. Unless you were Cal Omas or a civil liberties lawyer, the military junta was temporary and benign. There was a war on, after all. It was to be expected. I ought to write a study on this. How to take over the state? Smile, 
look reluctant, and keep the traffic flowing. And it was just Coruscant. The rest of the GA worlds went on running their planetary business as they saw fit, unmolested, and that meant there was no need to stretch the fleet and the defense forces by deploying them to keep order on thousands of other worlds, their own in many cases. All Jason and Neothel had to worry about was Coruscant, because the political and strategic reality was that Coruscant was the G.A., was Coruscant. The rest of the Alliance is detail. I have its heart and mind. Good morning, Jason said. The group of protesters stared at him with a collective, slowly dawning, oh, it's really him, expression. Even a face that had been on HNE as regularly as his took some recognizing out of context. He extended his hand to them, and one man actually shook it. Most species responded well to placatory courtesy. I just wanted to reassure you that Master Omus will get a scrupulously fair hearing. We've let him go home, too. When folks were worked up for yelling and seemed to want to be dragged away by CSF heavyweights, they were totally upended by having the object of their fury listen to them. Jason's patient smile met disoriented surprise. A couple of CSF officers began wandering across, probably expecting trouble, but Jason dissuaded them with a little force influence, and they stopped a few meters away to observe. More important, though, was the HNE news droid trundling around the Senate Plaza. There was always at least one on duty here, just hanging around to get stock shots, but now it had an actual story. Jason watched it approach in his peripheral vision. "'Doesn't matter how you dress it up,' said the young woman, holding one end of the free Omas banner. "'The G.A. is being run now by the Supreme Commander and the head of the Secret Police, and nobody voted for you.' Jason managed an expression of slightly wounded innocence. "'You're right. I didn't run for office. Which is why I won't remain Joint Chief of State any longer than I have to. Would you like to see something? Inside the building?' The woman looked at him suspiciously. "'There's always a catch.' The news droid was right behind them now. Sometimes the Force placed things in his grasp. Suddenly he realized that everything was being handed to him, and all he had to do was react, just as Lumia had told him, and not analyze everything. "'Your choice,' Jason said. "'I just want to show you the Chief of State's office. Anyone else want to come along?' The security guards weren't happy, but what Jason wanted, Jason got. He led a straggling group of protesters, day visitors, and the HNE droid through the glittering lobby and up in the turbo lift to the floor of offices where the public was almost never allowed, the seat of galactic government itself. A few civil servants in the corridor did a double-take, but carried on about their business. Neothel must have seen him come in on the security holocams, because she was wandering around the lobby clutching a couple of data pads. Jason acknowledged her with a smile, and walked up to the carved double doors of the Chief of State's suite of offices. The doors were sealed, taped shut. The bright yellow tape with the CSF logo and the legend Do Not Tamper was purely cosmetic but it made the point far better than the impregnable but invisible electronic lock. That's Chief Omis's office, Jason said, over the head of the HNE droid. He stood back casually to let it get a better shot of him explaining earnestly to this random sample of the electorate. It's for the elected head of state. It stays sealed until someone is elected to fill it. Neither I nor Admiral Neothel has moved in. 
That matters very much to us. The thing about Moan Cows was that you could never tell if they were rolling their eyes or just taking notice. Neothel was probably rolling hers, though. Jason could feel her amusement at his expense. The little crowd muttered and ooed and awed. It was a perfect media moment. The protesters seemed at a loss for words, but Jason was anxious that they not look humiliated. I hope we've reassured you. You're up to your neck in this too, Admiral. And I'm glad you feel you can raise this with us, because there's no point fighting a war if we can't behave as a democracy, even when things get difficult. The jumpy security guards who'd decided to follow him showed the party out. Everyone went away either happy or at least diffused. Jason felt Neothel's gaze boring a hole in him. Last time I saw anything that slick and oily, she said, was when Ocean leaked a whole lube reservoir over the aft weapons flat. Ah, but you were absolutely right to seal that office. Neither of us should have it. I believe in sharing everything. As do I, Jason said. So let's try to address the media jointly, shall we? No point looking like a publicity addict, Jason. Citizens might misunderstand your motives. I'm here to serve the galaxy, Jason replied, and meant every word. Never underestimate the power of being pleasant. That's fine, I'm Coruscant. But your charm doesn't travel well. Neothel beckoned him to follow. I have Senator Gassil in my office. And the senator for Mercana, Nav Ekat. We've hit a small snag in our new policy. Ekat didn't look like a woman who'd had a restful night. She didn't wait for Jason to sit down before she launched into a tirade that had obviously been gathering steam long before he and Neofel walked in. I understand you're concentrating forces in the Corellian and Bothan sectors, she said, stabbing her finger at the holochart in the center of the meeting table. Where does that leave us? Explain your concerns, said Jason. The new treaty between Roche and Mandalore. And you feel threatened by this? Given the state of our relations with Roche, yes. Are you aware that we've been having a disagreement about export markets? Gassel leaned forward. Put another way, the Verpine are accusing Mercana of reverse-engineering some of their most lucrative weapons command systems, breaching their patents, and selling cheap knockoffs to undermine their markets. Put another way, Verpine don't like healthy competition, said Eckhart. Now they've signed a deal with Mandalore for mutual aid and technical collaboration. It's the Bugs and Thugs show. Jason watched Neofel shift ever so slightly in her seat and felt her annoyance. Anyone who dismissed Verpine as Bugs probably also dismissed Moan Cows as Fish. Are you expecting this alliance to threaten your security directly? Jason asked. Because if the Verpine were seriously annoyed, they have plenty of military hardware to make their point without calling in Kaldabe. Verpine might make the stuff, she said, but they rarely use it in anger. The Mandalorians, on the other hand, treat warfare as a national sport. But this is about Mandalorian iron. Neofel was working up to telling Eckhart that Mercana was on its own. She'd probably enjoy it after that bug comment, too. The Verpine want to produce enhanced armaments and vessels under license. No, they want Mandalorian protection, too. Why? Jason couldn't see Mercana attacking Roche. 
They're afraid the fighting on Chemstore Eye will spill into their backyard, and their rich pickings that might prove too tempting for a system at war. I'm missing the connection. Mandalorian protection tends to be of the outreach kind, Colonel. It's a short step from turning out to repel the Kemi and making a disciplinary visit to us. Neothel got up and walked around the table, looking at the holochart from various angles. And are you breaching the Verpine patents? We don't think so, said the senator. But the products are very similar. You see, I'm not sure we should commit troops to trade disputes. This war is about the responsibility of member planets to commit military resources to common defense. That's one reason why the former chief of state is former, because he was ready to concede part of that principle. As a member of the GA, we expect support when attacked. Roche is a neutral world, Jason pointed out. If you were attacked, we'd have to assess the situation. But I feel this has to be referred to the interplanetary civil courts first. So you're saying we're on our own? Jason would play the nice officer today. The awful was doing a fine job of being the nasty one. I'm saying that you should try to resolve this dispute by other means, rather than escalate straight to saber-rattling. But... He thought about the talk of a new Mandalorian assault fighter. It was interesting enough on its own, but if it was a collaboration with the Verpine, the G.A. needed to get an idea of what it could do. He decided to disagree with Neothel. But perhaps the presence of a G.A. squadron and frigate might make Roche more willing to sit down and discuss the matter again. Neothel turned her head very slowly to stare at Jason. He knew the risk he was taking. If we have spare resources, then we'll consider it, she said. Roche warned us that it'll take direct action if we don't cease production of the disputed products. Eckhart looked at all three of them pointedly in sequence, as if defying them to say the word no out loud. Then she stood and picked up her folio case. So sooner rather than later, please, or you'll lose another rim world. And I don't mean resignation. Gasil watched Eckhart stalk out then shrugged. So much for the Mandalorian threat making the little planets rush to our protective arms, Cha. They did rush, Neothel said. And that's the problem. If we're seen deploying a Star Destroyer every time some member state has a local disagreement, we'll open the floodgates. Not that they're not starting to open already. Policy is to concentrate on breaking the big boys who won't play by G.A. rules. Or we'll be putting out fires across the galaxy for decades to come. Jason braced for impact. And Colonel Solo, you will not commit fleet resources like that without discussing the matter with me. I didn't commit anything. I just stated the obvious. And I didn't agree to it, either. Wouldn't it be useful to have an excuse to wander out to the rim and take a look at those new Mandalorian fighters? If they've built any yet. I say commit a couple of flights if we can't spare a complete squadron. If we move one of the frigates out from Bothan space, that'll bring it within range of Mercana. At a stretch. Are you sure you want to provoke Mandalore? Gassel asked. It's got that extra personal dimension now, and the last thing we need is Fett making this a vendetta against the rest of the G.A. His neutrality has been a bonus, to be honest. I'm well aware that Fett has neither gone away 
nor forgotten his daughter, Jason said. But he's far too smart to waste his troops to fight a personal feud. Mandalore was always a problem. Always had been. Always would be. It wasn't big enough to be a galactic threat, but wasn't small enough to dismiss. Or remove. Tough on chaos. And the causes of chaos. It was being the third element in a universe of pairs that made Mandalorians disruptive. The universe was binary, bipolar, ruled by the balance between opposites, whether that was dark and light, or action and reaction. It couldn't accommodate that extra pole and remain orderly. Mandalorians were an inherently destabilizing influence, "'Are you still with us, Jason?' Giselle asked. "'You look distracted.' "'Just wishing the Mandalorians would go away.' "'Pay them to stay at home,' said Neothel, gathering up her data pads to leave. "'That's the permanent solution. "'As long as they have the occasional therapeutic fight to work off their aggression, they'll be happy.' And that's just the females. She headed for the door. I have fleet commanders to brief. Shame we can't approach Fett to see if he's changed his mind about staying out of the fighting. Isn't paying them not to fight tantamount to an insult to their honor? Jason asked. I think you're getting them mixed up with some other warmongering savages. They'd see it as protection money. They're pragmatists. If only all wars had such simple economic solutions. Gasil smiled ruefully. Well, they've mostly got economic causes. Not this one, Jason said. It's about order. About responsibility. Neothel and Gisil both concealed their reactions at the same time and said nothing. He could tell they thought he was becoming eccentric, or perhaps that he hadn't quite got the hang of high-level politics. Either way, their reaction said that he wasn't playing the same game as them. And they were right. But it was all going too smoothly. No riots, no outcry except for some of the minority media and the usual suspects in the legal and liberties community. But apart from endless media analysis of Omis's time in office, almost as if he'd died, the vast majority of Coruscanti had treated it like a fall from grace instead of a military coup. Having a Jedi on board did seem to make the regime change appear much more wholesome in public opinion. I'd expected to be storming barricades this week, Jason said. What did we do right? We didn't suspend any normality, said Giselle, making interesting use of we. Every other politician remained in place. Just the people who administer it at the top level changed. Order. It's all about order. This is the microcosm of the entire galaxy. The dry run for how my rule will be in due course. Quiet normality for the majority. But Jason was worried that it might prove to be the lull before the storm. He thought of Tenel Ka and Alana, and the impulse to visit them while he still could was overwhelming. Lumia said he had to listen to those voices, and not think sensible things like mundane beings did. I need forty-eight hours out of the office, he said, to catch up on things. Can I trust you two not to oust me while I'm away? Neothel didn't seem amused. You'll return to find Boba Fett sitting in your office. But if you have to go, you must. I trust you implicitly, 
he said. He trusted her not to be stupid, at least. Lumia could keep a watchful eye on the situation while he made the trip to Hapes. Boba Fett. That was an axe still waiting to fall. And if it didn't keep him awake at night, he was certainly conscious that Fett's continued lack of bloody revenge was unsettling. Jason put the Mandalorians on the list of things for which he'd find a solution when he was established as a Sith Lord. Vader had had the measure of them in his day. Jason would as well. That, too, was in his destiny. Luminous Gardens Spa, Drawl, Corellian System So, still no new Prime Minister? Mara asked. You're taking a big risk coming here, said Leia. No, there's a triumvirate of the three main party leaders running Corellia until they find a new target. Sorry, I mean candidate. Two dead inside a few months tends to dampen the applicant's enthusiasm. Well, we score for efficiency. At least we can run the GA on, too. How very Sith. Mara nearly choked. It wasn't funny at all. Did Leia know something? Mara, are you okay? I think my encounter with Lumia made me allergic to the word. With a scarf around her hair, Mara was just another middle-aged female human enjoying the resort with a friend. The two walked around the colonnade of exclusive stores and beauty salons, and Mara still found it disconcerting that anyone could be leading a normal life when hers, and that of so many others, was caught up in the turmoil of war. Normality seemed somehow obscene. I had to see you face to face. You don't want Jason to arrest you for setting foot on Coruscant, and you know he would. Where's Han? He's gone on an errand with Lando. Where's Luke? Seeing as it's just us girls talking, I smell a delicate problem. There was no point tiptoeing around it. Mara had as much evidence as she needed. But this was Leia's son under discussion. Leia had already lost Anakin. Mara had to be absolutely, completely certain. Ninety-nine percent sure wasn't good enough. Jason, she said, always is. I don't know how to say this to you. Try blurting. He's out of control. I mean badly out of control. Uh-huh. I admit it's challenging to have to keep tabs on your only son by watching the news coverage of his latest power grab. How's Han taking it? Not well, to say the least. He veers between wanting to disown him again and talking about getting together to talk him around. You know, sometimes I think it's going to kill him. Mara found that it wasn't certainty of Jason's guilt she was looking for. It was any excuse to say that it was all Lumia's doing, and that by removing her, Jason could be brought back to his old self. Whatever had happened to Jason over the years, and that five-year sabbatical was still largely a blank sheet, there seemed nothing of that old self left to recover. If this wasn't my nephew and Leia's son— would I still be trying to find a reason not to do something about him? No. You're sure you're feeling okay, Mara? Leia was one of the few people Mara had ever truly admired. She was pretty well the only person other than Luke who Mara knew would never fall apart, however bad things got. But she still couldn't bring herself to sit Leia down and give her the full catalog of Jason's crimes. Yes, they were crimes. There was no other word for it. I'm going to ask you something, Leia, and if you never want to speak to me again afterward, I'll understand. This isn't going to end in a punchline, is it? 
You're serious. You have no idea how serious. Then stop dragging it out. Okay. Do you think Jason is susceptible enough to be controlled by Lumia? I should have put the list to her first. I should have told her about Nelani and making Ben kill Gedjin and his little chats with his Sith buddy and the fact that he seems to think my son is expendable. And apprentice. What kind of apprentice would Lumia be talking about? Mara faced the inevitable and hated herself for refusing to see it earlier. No, Leia said at last. He's stubborn and he's his own man. She could make the difference between him doing something and hesitating, but she could never make him act totally against his will. I've had to come to terms with that, but he's still my boy, and I still love him. It was the last thing Mara wanted to hear. She wanted to hear that Jason was a kid who went along with the others, who got into bad company but was a good boy at heart. She wanted a reason to go after evil Lumia and rescue deluded Jason, because that was easy, black and white, palatable. Wrong. If it hadn't been happening within her own family, she'd never have hesitated. For a moment she wondered if she was set on this. This didn't have a name yet, not a word, but she knew what this was, because it was her own son at most risk. My son or yours? It could have been selfish maternal priority, just using the rest of Jason's actions to justify lashing out to save her child. She tried to imagine Ben dead, and how she'd feel then. She could have stopped Palpatine and didn't. History had taught her a lesson about hindsight, and it wouldn't give her a second chance. What was happening to Ben would happen to other people's sons, too. Mara, I think you should have spent a few days in bed after the fight with Lumia, said Leia, and slipped her arm through hers. You're not yourself at all. Let's find a stupidly expensive restaurant and forget the fat content. Take it easy for a few hours, because I can't run on adrenaline and anxiety twenty-four hours a day like you seem to. Leia, I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to stop, Jason. I have to. I'm going to have to kill your son— because that's the only way of stopping him now. Okay, but my treat. You're on. Part of Mara was appalled that she could even think it, and part was telling her that this was what happened when she forgot that Force users' highs and lows weren't just family spats, but dynastic battles that could shake the whole galaxy. They didn't have the luxury of small stakes. I like the fountain, Leia said. They do a dessert called the Fruit Mountain. Takes two hungry women to tackle one. Sounds good. It was surreal. They sat on opposite sides of the table. Blue-white dia wood set with iridescent transparent tableware and a pyramid of multicolored fruit held together by golden-spun sugar and dusted with real citrus-flavored snow, was placed between them. There was a point at which Mara's eyes met Leia's as they attacked the dessert with a spoon each, and it would be a frozen moment of horror in Mara's mind forever. Leia smiled, the look in her eyes pure compassion and Mara knew that she couldn't see the truth behind hers. She felt like dirt. She hated herself. You need to know there's nothing else, absolutely nothing that you can do to save Jason. Mara needed to confront him one last time. If anyone could stop him at the brink, the final one anyway, then it was her. 
because she'd crossed from the other direction. She didn't think it would work, but she owed it to Leia. And Han. She was planning to take Jason from them, and they'd already lost Anakin. There was only so much pain a family could take. Chapter 16 The government of Bathawi is prepared to pay 20 million credits per month for the exclusive services of a Mandalorian assault fleet with infantry. We would also be greatly interested in acquiring a squadron of Besulik assault fighters, and would be prepared to pay a premium to have exclusive purchase rights to this craft. Formal Offer to the Government of Mandalore Senate Lobby, Coruscant There you are, said Mara, ambushing Jason as he stepped out of the turbo lift. Glad I caught you. He registered genuine surprise and that gave her more satisfaction than he'd ever know. No, he hadn't felt her presence when it mattered. Thank you, Ben. Nice trick. Hi, Aunt Mara. What can I do for you? Jason tried to do that act of dithering on the spot, the carefully calculated body language that said he really did want to stay and talk, but duty was dragging him away. What an actor. She could act, too. But this wasn't the time for it. I'd love to catch up over a drink, he said. But it's late, and I've got an appointment first thing tomorrow. Can we fix a time for when I'm free, say in a couple of days? It won't take long, Jason. It needs to be now. Now it was her turn to take over the choreography, stepping in his way so that if he wanted to pass... He'd have to make a deliberate and rejecting sidestep. And Jason wouldn't be that blatant. Not to her. It would make her suspicious. Too late? You've already done that, Jason. But for Leia's sake, for Han's sake, I have to try this. Okay, he said. There was something deeply unsettling about a Force user, about anyone, really, who gave off no Force presence. It was like standing next to someone who wasn't breathing and had no pulse, a little too close to death for Mara's liking. It also pressed all those paranoid and defensive buttons, like someone whispering behind his hand in someone else's presence. It said, guilty, unnatural, and secret. If the Yuzhan Vong had been the kindest and sweetest beings in the universe, Mara knew she would have mistrusted them anyway, because they didn't show up in the Force as being alive and there. She steered Jason over to an alcove. Psychologically, he might have felt more vulnerable being confronted with his acts in the middle of the lobby, where everyone could hear and see them. On the other hand, the alcove could make him feel cornered if she maneuvered him to stand with his back to the wall. Either way, she was going to get a reaction out of him. She couldn't outstrip his force powers, but the tricks of flesh and blood put her on a more level playing field. You don't fool me, she said. Not any longer, anyway. He tried his baffled little boy grin. What am I supposed to have done? Remember what I was? You've lost me, Aunt Mara. This is about Lumia. It stops here and now. You've turned into something vile, and you're too smart to be conned into that even by her. Beyond dark. See, I've been both sides, and I know. Well, I don't know what you mean. I really don't. Wrong answer. I'll deal with Lumia in due course, but I know what you've been doing. I don't buy the excuses that your poor parents make for you every criffing time. So I'm going to set you a test. Mara, are you okay? You're not well, are you? 
Don't even think about trying that one. If you acknowledge the terrible things you've done, and whatever's left of Leia's son is still functioning, then come with me right now to the temple. We'll get the whole council together, and we'll deprogram you. Jason put his hands in his pockets and looked down at the floor. He still had that silly grin on his face, but it was fading a little around the eyes. Mara, he said with an exaggerated softness that made her want to punch him. Mara, I think you're forgetting that I'm Joint Chief of State now, and I don't have time for this emotional outpouring. Because whatever Ben's been telling you, he was digging himself deeper into the pit. She'd really hoped he'd step back, and she knew she was just as stupid for hoping as she'd been for turning a blind eye to his darkness in the first place. There's no Ben in this, Jason. She stopped her finger a fraction short of jabbing him in the chest. Leave Ben out of it. If you so much as breathe on him, I'll skin you alive, and that's not a euphemism. Last chance. Drop this Sith garbage now, or take what's coming. There. She'd said it. Sith. Jason's grin had vanished completely, and he looked like a total stranger. The Emperor had had yellow eyes, she recalled. They said he'd once had a kindly face with normal blue ones. But if Jason's turned yellow, he couldn't possibly have looked any more alien to her than he did right then. There was nothing supernatural about his ambition, callousness, and arrogance. Good night, Aunt Mara, he said, and walked away. She didn't watch him go. She didn't need to. This is all your fault, girl. You should have listened to Luke. He was never fooled by all that sophistry, and you stopped him dealing with it because you couldn't deal with a teenage boy like any mom has to. The least you can do is clean up this sewer yourself. Okay, buddy, she said, not caring if a couple of Biff senators were staring at her. Okay. There were some things she couldn't walk away from, even though they'd tear her family apart. It was better torn than destroyed, because in time it would heal. Jason was going to die. Jason Solo's Apartment Building, Coruscant Lumia had never had any problem with biding her time. But Jason was becoming too caught up in the administrative tedium of his new toy, the Galactic Alliance, for her comfort, and her instinct told her that the Force was restless for change. It was late, past midnight, and he still wasn't back. He's flesh. There's something about being wholly flesh and blood that distracts you from the task. And the more flesh you sacrifice, the less heir to its limits you become. But I can't achieve what he can. The perfect balance. Strength driven by passion, but not confined by sentimentality. Lumia waited outside Jason's apartment building, taking in the glittering night and feeling the imminence of upheaval like the oppressive air before a violent storm. His accession to Sith Lord had to happen very soon. The momentum of events, and the ease with which they'd fallen into place, pointed to the gathering pace of the fulfillment of the Tassel prophecies— he will immortalize his love. 
Lumia no longer spent frustrating hours contemplating the meaning. It would happen, and it would become clear. Jason didn't appear as she'd expected. He was hard to locate, a habitual hider in the force. So she went up to the apartment, bypassed his security locks, and sat down to wait for him. It was important that he stayed focused on the spiritual side of his progression and left the material aspect to Neothel. When he had achieved his destiny, then he could return to the military arena with skills beyond Neothel's and change the course of the war. First things first. She almost expected to see Ben Skywalker come through the doors. Some of his clothing and possessions were still in the apartment. But he'd gone. He was too soft to stay the course, just as she'd always said. If he needed time off to weep and recover every time he carried out a necessary and unpleasant task, he'd proven he was fit to be the sacrifice Jason would make, and too dangerously weak to be his apprentice. A Sith Lord could only function with a strong apprentice. Like a good government, a Sith needed a strong opposition to keep him sharp. Eventually, the doors opened, and Jason stood in the hallway, looking as if he hadn't wanted to find her there. He had a paper-wrapped package under one arm, and some disturbance clung to him, as if he'd had a fight or an accident. "'Has anything happened?' she asked. "'Oh, a disagreement with Mara about... Ben. Spare me overprotective mothers.' Well, she might have a point. The time's coming. You keep saying that. Jason walked past her and went into his bedroom. She heard him opening doors and drawers as if he was in a hurry. I'm anticipating events like a madman and looking for signs everywhere. And nothing's happening. Unless you count getting rid of both Gedjin and Omas. I think that's climactic enough for one week, don't you? Mundane politics. Maybe. Look, I've covered a lot of ground these last few weeks, and grasped every opportunity I've had to force things into fruition. The banging and scraping of closets gave way to rustling fabric, and when Jason emerged, he was carrying a small holdall. I want some solitude to think. Keep an eye on Neatha while I'm gone. Jason didn't need solitude. He was quite capable of shutting out the world any time he wanted to. The man could meditate in the middle of a hurricane. He wasn't running away. He was going in pursuit of something. How long? Lumia asked, immediately ready to calculate the maximum distance he could travel in the time available. Twenty-four hours, possibly forty-eight. If I stay away any longer, I don't think Neothel will misbehave, but I think Senator Gassil might get ideas. That third element, where only two can exist, you know. I understand, she said. Jason had done this before. He would vanish for short periods, confide in nobody, and come back with a sense of melancholy about him, and a little of his dark energy diminished. Lumia had put it down to natural apprehension about the size of the task he had ahead of him, and she'd tolerated it. But he couldn't afford to be running off again at this critical stage. And if Jason was in trouble, he'd never ask for help. It was for his own good, as well as the galaxy's. This time it was important for her to find out what was pulling him away just as he was on the brink of making everything happen. She'd follow him. She had to keep his path clear now, and remove all distractions. Will you have access to HNE where you're going? Or do you want me to brief you on your return? I don't want to be contacted, he said. If something major happens, I'll know. Just mind the shop. 
the doors closed behind him. Lumia wandered into the bedroom to see if he'd left the package he'd been clutching under his arm. There was nothing on the bed, and when she paused to feel the tiny disturbances that showed her where objects might have been hidden, there was no trace of anything beyond items taken, just a change of clothing and the small necessities men needed. Jason seemed to like plain antiseptic soap, a discovery that she found both touching and funny. Jason was moving ever closer to self-denial. He didn't have to indulge that nasty Jedi habit. She'd have to help him be a little kinder to himself when he'd made his transition. The apartment was more austere than it had been a few months before. Every time she came here, there was one less comfort and fewer personal touches than the last. There were now no hollow images of family and friends to be seen. He hadn't even stuffed them into a cupboard to avoid their accusing glances that asked what had happened to good old Jason. But it wasn't altogether a bad sign. Perhaps he was washing away the old Jason and preparing for the one he would become. So if he needed to do that by wearing sackcloth and brushing his teeth with salt, that was fine. She shut off the lights, checked that the apartment was secure, and made her way out of the apartment building to the walkways of Coruscant. She slipped through the back alley and into the disused warehouse where she'd hidden the Sith meditation sphere. Ben Skywalker did have his uses. Even insects had a vital role in the ecology. The ship would come into its own now. Lumia might not have been able to find Jason when he vanished into the Force, but the ancient red sphere somehow could. She could feel its curiosity, and even a little excitement. It wanted to be useful again, to serve. It extruded its boarding ramp without even being asked. Follow Jason Solo she thought, and pictured him in her mind so that the sphere didn't get distracted by Ben. It seemed fascinated by the boy. Follow the Sith Lord to be. He was going to succeed. Bevin Vasser Farm, Mandalore The hard red soil was baked solid like pottery clay, and it shattered at the first blow of his vibra-shovel. Fett stared at a stark white tracery of bones beneath, highlighted by the harsh sun. "'Why did you leave me here, son?' asked Jango Fett. Where was he? There was no face, nothing at all, but the voice was right there. "'I've been waiting.' "'Where are you, Dad? I can't find you!' I waited. Where are you? Fett was shouting for his father, but his voice was a kid's, and the hands he could see clutching the shovel were an old man's, veined and spotted. Panic and desperation nearly choked him. Dad, I can't see you! He started tearing aside the hard dirt, and the gritty particles jammed painfully under his fingernails. He kept digging, sobbing, where are you? Fett woke with a start. His heart was pounding. Sweat prickled on his back. Then it faded, and he was looking at the chrono on the far wall. In the weeks since he'd brought his father's remains back to Mandalore, he'd had that nightmare far too often. He swung his legs over the side of the bed and tested his weight on them, waiting for the pain to start gnawing at the joints. It wasn't so bad. In fact, he just felt a little stiff around his lower back, as if he'd been digging. Maybe he'd acted out that nightmare. He bounced on his heels a few times to see what happened. There was no pain. He didn't even feel that nausea that had been so routine he'd forgotten what it felt like to wake up without it. Apart from running a temperature, he felt better than he had in days. Months, in fact. He was alive. He wouldn't believe he was in the clear 
until the nerf doctor came back with the test results. But he knew something fundamental had changed. So you didn't poison me, Jang. He went to the refresher to shower. If a torrent of cold water from an overhead cistern could be called that, and shaved with an ancient fixed blade that nicked his chin. Where the sarlacc's acid hadn't left smooth, glossy scar tissue, there was still stubble to tackle, and these days most of it was pure white and hard to see. He shaved twice a day anyway. These were the unguarded, naked times when he allowed himself to think of Aelin and other painful things, because he had to look himself in the eye, and he wasn't a liar. Lying wasn't just bad, it was stupid. Lying to yourself was the most stupid thing of all. And now that he wasn't so preoccupied with his own death, he could think about the deaths of others. There was a lot of unfinished business. He'd start with Aelin. She was a stranger when I opened that body bag. A middle-aged woman. Not lovely like her mother. Old before her time. Exhausted. Dead. And still my baby. My little girl. I don't care if you tried to kill me. I really don't. Killing was his trade. He didn't enjoy it, and he didn't dread it. The only person whose death he knew would make him feel good, and not just competent, was Jason Solo. Better that you rot than die. I can wait. Thanks for motivating me to survive. I'm back. Fett checked his face in the mirror for missed beard, double-checked with his fingertips, then lowered his helmet over his head. The world became sharp and fully comprehensible again, with all the extra senses built into his armor. At a time when other men had failing eyesight and unreliable hearing, Fett could see through solid walls and eavesdrop kilometers away. There was a lot to be said for smart tech. He flexed his fingers in his gauntlets, finally feeling complete and girded against the world. Yes, I really am back. He rode the speeder bike into Keldabe and hammered on the doors of the vet's surgery. She had her name on a durasteel plate. He shall make it. A man leaned out of the open upper window looking bleary-eyed and stared down at Fett. He disappeared again. Sweetness! he bellowed. It's your special patient! The vet appeared at the window. I suppose I've got to open early, especially for you. Haven't you got any letters after your name? Nerfs can't read. Why bother? Got my results? Yeah. And? The cell degenerations stopped. But the lab tech over on Dawn said we shouldn't breed from you. Somehow she was easier to deal with than Bellwine. You know that needle was for Banthas? Felt like it. You're a hard man, Fett. I'm glad you're not dead. How much do I owe you? A quilt. A nice, thick red one. Fett went back to Slave One and caught up with the news. Mercana and Roche were heading for a showdown. It was a good opportunity to show what a single Besulik could do, if the Verpine wanted to invoke the treaty. Fear Feck. I did it again. I'm going to live. If nothing else went wrong, he'd have another thirty years, maybe more. Most people would have been overjoyed at the reprieve. But Fett found he was actually glad that he'd come so close to death again. 
because it had a way of sharpening him up and making him think harder. He liked the risk. He liked beating the odds. I suppose I should tell Myrta. Now he felt he could ask her what Aelin had taught her over the years to make her hate him so much. What he really wanted to know, though, was where Aelin had learned her hatred. Most kids from divorces didn't pursue a homicidal feud across half a galaxy. But it could wait an hour or so while he had a decent breakfast. He'd enjoy it today. He was going to live. Chapter 17 I find it interesting that Town Wee has never held it against Fett for attacking Camino. Either he's her favorite unfinished project, or there's something else we don't know. Jang Skirata, musing on the motives of Kaminoans. Lon Shevu's apartment, Port Quarter, Coruscant. It's really kind of you to put me up, sir. Ben tried to take up as little room as possible on Captain Shevu's sofa. It wasn't just awkwardness about intruding on someone's privacy. Ben found himself trying to hide. Not in the Force, but from it. Ideally, he'd have gone home with Mom. But that meant Dad, too, and he simply couldn't face him yet. You're not really afraid of your dad, are you? Shevu handed him a plate of breadsticks filled with fruit preserves, which was a weird combination, but he seemed to leave the proper cooking to his girlfriend. He seems such a nice guy. He is, said Ben. But did you ever think your parents knew everything you were thinking, and everything you'd done wrong just by looking at you? All the time. Jedi parents really can. Well, nearly. Shevu's opinion of Jason showed on his face now that he was off duty. I think Master Skywalker would be angry with the person who made you do it, not you. Oh, he's angry enough with Jason. Sorry, I shouldn't put you on the spot about your family. It's not fair. Forget I said it. I think I did the right thing for the wrong reasons. Well, beats doing the wrong thing for the right reasons— Classic excuse, that one. I was a cop. I know. Do you want to stay in the GAG? I miss CSF, actually. I miss catching real criminals and showing tourists the way to the rotunda. He wandered into the kitchen, and there was a banging and clattering of dishes. He came back with a glass of juice and drank it in two gulps. You sure you're all right? Oh, yeah. Look, I'll be out of your way as soon as I can. No rush. Shula thinks it's great that you wash the dishes. Shevu's girlfriend said he was a nice, polite boy. Ben thought that providing a safe haven for him was worth help with the chores, at the very least. I can force-dry them, too. Shevu laughed and handed him the remote control for the lights. Ben got the feeling that Shevu was happier keeping an eye on him in the aftermath of the assassination because he didn't approve of the Jedi habit of letting children carry weapons and fight. As far as he was concerned, Ben shouldn't have been serving in the front lines before he was at least eighteen. He was just too polite to say that he thought Jedi made bad parents. Poor Mom. Ben slept. He had a few odd dreams about Lecauf that woke him up, and the grief when he woke up properly and remembered his comrade was dead was painful. He lay wondering about Lecauf's folks and how they were coping, and then he thought he drifted off again because he could hear, no, he could feel a voice in his head asking where he was. He sat up. He knew he was fully awake, because he could see the environment control light on the wall, winking faint red every ten seconds. It took him a while to work out why he knew the voice, but couldn't put a face to it when he shut his eyes again. It was the Sith ship. He didn't know where it was, 
but it was calling him. It wanted to know where he was. Sith Sphere. Color orange. No index number. Last known registered owner, Lumia. Ben decided to treat it like a stolen speeder, the way Shavu would. I owe Jason this. He'd never have done these things without Lumia twisting his mind. Shows he's not half as clever as he thinks he is. Mom would probably try to talk him out of it. But they'd reached an understanding now that he had to do things his own way, because she couldn't expect anything else from him, given his pedigree. Ben pulled on his clothes, left a scribbled flimsy note for Shevu, and set off for the GAG compound to liberate an unmarked long-range speeder. The nice thing about being the secret police was that, provided you signed out the kit, nobody asked you what you planned to do with it. And it was legitimate police business to catch criminals. It was only when he fumbled in his pocket for his ID that he realized he'd left his vibroblade at Chevu's. He hoped he wouldn't need his mom's luck tonight. Skywalker's Apartment, Coruscant Luke was asleep when Mara got back, and she was relieved. It saved a lot of awkward questions. She peered through the doors, counted the seconds between rasping snores, and decided he was out cold. Good. She slipped past the bed and selected her favorite working clothes, dark gray fatigues with plenty of pockets for storing small weapons and ammo. She had no idea how long it would take to run Jason to ground, so she opted to pack for a mission, as much as she could cram into her backpack. I've got to stick on his tail now. I've got to strike when I can. She could track Lumia, and he was still in touch with her. If she hung around Lumia, then she'd eventually get Jason where she wanted him, away from the genteel, constitutional way of doing things on Coruscant. Jason had said he had an appointment, too, and while it might have been another of his lies, the chances were that he'd want to tell Lumia that Mara was onto them. I'll save you the trouble. She made a conscious effort not to see Leia's face in her mind's eye, and somehow she'd erased poor Han from this altogether. It wasn't that father's feelings didn't matter, but she had a better idea of the pain Leia would go through. However old kids got, the memory of them as newborns never faded. It might be true for dads as well, but Mara only knew what a mother felt, and that was bad enough. She checked her data pad for the transponder trace. Ben's showed he was still at Chevu's, and so he was one factor she didn't have to worry about. Lumia's transponder indicated she was heading for the Perlemian node just off Coruscant. If Jason wasn't with her, Mara thought, she might well get a lead to one of her bolt holes. In the assassination business, every scrap of data on a target's habits and movements was valuable. It would be worth the journey, and the technician at the base was used to Jedi booking out flight time in stealth X's. She didn't have to fill out any forms that said her mission was to kill the Joint Chief of State. Mara closed the inner doors to keep the light in the hallway from waking Luke, and paused at the apartment's front entrance. Okay, I'll risk it. If he wakes up, though, it'll be another argument. She put down her pack and tiptoed back into the bedroom, leaned over Luke, still snoring like a turbo saw, and kissed his forehead as lightly as she could. He grunted. Sorry, I never spotted it. She mouthed at him. But better late than never. Luke grunted again, and his eyelids twitched. Mara debated whether to give him a little force touch deep in his mind and see if she could get him to smile in his sleep, but decided she was pushing her luck, and Jason probably had a head start on her. Lumia definitely did. Mara paused at the doors, 
and left a flimsy note stuck on them. Gone hunting for a few days. Don't be mad at me, farm boy. There was no need to say who the quarry was. She'd have a hard enough time explaining when she returned. Sith Meditation Sphere, Perlemian Trade Route Hush, Lumia said aloud. I have no idea if he can hear you. The Meditation Sphere had developed an annoying habit of asking her questions. It wanted to know why there were so few... Lumia wasn't sure where to begin with such a vague question. The ship had been buried on Zeost for more time than it wanted to remember, it told her, and now it was curious to know where all the Dark Ones had gone. It's a long story, Lumia said. We haven't been in the Ascendant for a long time. Jason Solo will change all that. What about the others? Oh, Alima. She comes and goes, broken, but sometimes very happy. It was a good description of Alima's almost bipolar moods, murderous, bitter obsession punctuated by highs of murderous, triumphant obsession. The sphere was very attuned to feelings, it seemed. Maybe it could sense darkness anywhere, like a homing beacon, so that it could go to the aid of Seth in difficulty. I told her to tail Jason, but I should have known better than to rely on a psychiatric case. But who else is there? Apart from me, that is. Plenty of little darknesses. The two with my flame. Lumia repeated it to herself. Flame. Ah, red hair. Mara Jade Skywalker. She was the Emperor's hand, an agent for the dark side, just like me. The boy is her son. You darknesses... Should never fight. So few of you. I stopped her fighting. You certainly did. It was fascinating that the ship could still sense the dark side in Mara, even though she'd abandoned her roots. But to taste it in Ben, too, it might have been in his genes. Or perhaps the ship was reacting to his new career as a state assassin. Like mother, like son. Lumia almost thought she'd written off Ben too soon. Do you sense Dark Ones near? The Broken One is looking for the Lord to be. If she looks as if she's going to interfere, remove her. Dark or not. Lumia had told Alima to track Jason, but now wasn't the best time for Alima to interfere. Jason Solo is our priority. The ship went quiet. It was impossible to get an accurate sense of speed in a vessel with no instruments in hyperspace, but she could measure the duration of the journey on her chrono and the ship could tell her where its equivalent location was in real space. Past Arcania. Past Chaswa. Where was Jason going? Not Zeost, unless he was taking an extraordinary route. He'd be brushing the Roche sector, if he dropped out of hyperspace, and for a moment she wondered if he was simply panicking about the possibility of the Roche Mandalorian arms deal turning the war in the Confederation's favor and going to the Verpine to undermine the pact. But that was routine work for minions, for his admirals and agents, and she'd be annoyed if he was wasting his energies on that. He leaves hyperspace, the ship said at last. Where is he? Hapes Cluster. Follow him. 
Perhaps he was going to enlist the Queen Mother's help. The Verpine seemed to be troubling him. That meant Lumia hadn't heard the full story about the arms deal. This is beneath you, Jason, she sighed. Priorities. You really can't delegate, can you? That's one thing that your grandfather could do. Jason was heading for Hapes itself. Lumia encouraged the Sith Sphere to leave more distance between them by imagining a cord stretching to a hair's thickness. Eventually, Jason reached the edge of the Hapen's security area and slipped through. He lands. He has an entry code. Lumia debated whether to use the code to follow him more closely, then decided against it. She didn't know if that would attract attention. Maintain position until he leaves. She decided to sit it out and hoped she wasn't misjudging the situation, and that Neothel and Gasil weren't now declaring the glorious Third Republic or some such nonsense. The trouble with the small people was that they often left little in the force for her to feel at this distance, and Coruscant's citizens were so passive and compliant that there would be no great disturbance for her to detect, even if Neothel declared martial law in Jason's absence. It was nothing that couldn't be put right on her return, but she'd have to explain why she'd been goofing off, as Ben might call it, and Jason would become petulant and uncooperative. Jason's like a moody teenager at the moment. When he makes the transition to Sith Lord, he'll settle down fast, and she'd be no more used to him after she found him a replacement for Ben Skywalker. Lumia accepted that her days were numbered. She lost herself in meditation, wondering who might be Jason's apprentice to come, when an explosion of feeling shook her as if she'd been grabbed by the shoulders and kissed by a total stranger. The Sith Sphere reacted too, a great soaring excitement that seemed to bounce between her and the ship's bulkheads, What's happening? Ship! What is it? But she already knew. It was Jason, slipping out of his permanently repressed force state and allowing himself intense, overpowering emotion for the first time in ages. The image the ship threw into Lumia's mind was one of gulping down an icy glass of water after weeks in a burning desert. The sensation was intense enough to bring Lumia to the point of gasping. He has love, said the ship. He has loves there. So Jason Solo had a lover. Stupid boy. He could have had any number of lovers. After he achieved his full power. Passion was fine. Attachment could magnify strength but running around the galaxy for a secret assignation smacked of a teenager's total surrender to hormonal crisis. Jason, you're thirty-one, thirty-two, and a grown man doesn't have to sneak light years away for a little romance, not even one in your position. Unless... Lumia could think like Jason now, even if his more vulnerably human side caught her wrong-footed. Hapes. This was Hapes, and it involved something he'd kept secret even from her. His lover was part of the royal court then, the epicenter of paranoia when it came to alliances of any kind, because indiscretion often meant a blade between the ribs or a sprinkling of poison in the wine. That would explain a secret dash across hyperspace at sporadic intervals. And Queen Mother Tenel Ka was a Jedi to whom Jason had been close for years. It was conjecture, but Jason wouldn't consort with a palace maid. 
he was conscious of his lofty station in life. He would be drawn to a Jedi queen. Lumia risked searching the Force more closely for him, to try to get an impression of exactly where he was. The sphere said he was in the palace itself, and although the tidal wave of emotion that had burst through had ebbed, it was still powerful enough to focus on. She shut out everything else, even her constant obsession, Jason's destiny, and just opened her mind to the most basic impressions. His force presence could be strong enough to drown out everyone else's around him. Now that he thought he was unseen and undetected, his presence was as deafening as a shout. Lumia couldn't even feel the ship around her. The sense she was wrapped up in now wasn't taste or sight or sound, but touch. There was something soft, silky, and furry in her hands, Jason's hands, and it yielded when he closed his fingers. It meant nothing to her. And then, then she understood. Ship, you said loves. Two, the ship said. Yes, two. The ship could detect force users, and it felt there were two more on Hapes, two more whose link with Jason Solo had to be kept secret at any cost, and who would have an emotionally overwhelmed Jason clutching something soft and covered in silky fur, a toy, a soft toy. Jason had come back to the apartment with a plain package gripped tight under his arm, and left with it. He'd bought a cuddly toy for a child he loved with his entire being. Lumia snapped herself out of the connection and managed to stop short of beating her fists on the stark red deck of the sphere in sheer frustration. The ship might have taken it the wrong way. Oh, Jason, you had a child with Tenel Ka. Lumia now understood his fear and desperation. She thought of all the conversations she'd had with him about immortalizing his love, and suddenly realized who was in his mind when he looked so utterly tortured and desperate as she explained that he had to destroy what he loved most. It explained everything. Lumia never thought she could pity someone again enough to weep, but she found her vision blurred by tears that threatened to spill down her cheeks. She settled in for a long wait in a state of mental silence, not even wanting to occupy herself with getting to know this extraordinary ship. She'd need to be there for Jason after this. It seemed insultingly banal to kill time, when he was about to make a sacrifice that almost no mundane being or Jedi would understand or forgive. Yes, it was a very high price indeed. Chapter 18 The Roche government has given Mercana 24 hours to cease production of weapons command systems that are allegedly in breach of patents or face what it describes as immediate enforcement. G.A. Chief of Staff Neothel tonight warned Roche against military action and said GA fighters would be patrolling the system in a peacekeeping role. HNE News Update Hapes Mara dropped out of hyperspace, still putting together scenarios to explain why Lumia had gone racing down the Perlemian to the Hapes Cluster, shortly after a GAG Stealth X was signed out of the GA fleet hangar by Colonel Jason Solo. There was no sign of the Stealth X. If Jason wasn't making himself detectable in the Force, Mara couldn't spot the stealth fighter any better than an enemy could. But ideas were forming in her mind. Either Lumia was fermenting more trouble to break the Alliance, in which case Hapes was a wasted journey, or she was meeting someone here, like Alima. 
Sorry, Jaina. I'll try to bring her back alive for you, but no promises. Not in this mood. Or she was pursuing Jason. Or maybe she'd found the transponder and was back to playing tag. Mara thought that it was odd that the ship hadn't spat out the tiny device, given that it was smart enough to throw a line around her neck to save Lumia's tin backside. It could have killed me easily enough, too. But it didn't. Mara disliked reasoning in a vacuum. She didn't quite trust the crazier things that crossed her mind lately. But maybe the ship still saw her as a darksider. It would be academic soon, but the thought that she might still have that tang of darkness about her produced some mixed emotions. Yeah, I'm going to kill my sister-in-law's son. On the dark scale of ten, that's a twelve. Now that her anger had ebbed, she was beginning to wonder what she was doing here. The Hapens would wonder that, too, if they managed to spot a stealth X hanging around their system unannounced. Lumia's transponder showed that her ship was sitting in a cluster of asteroids, but she wasn't showing up on scans. What was she waiting for? Mara ran a discreet check on her instruments. If she went active on sensors, she'd give away her position, so it had to be a case of passive detection only. She was watching or waiting, and how the Hapens hadn't taken an unhealthy interest in the sphere was anyone's guess. But Lumia had a talent for evasion. Follow the credits, but in this case, follow the Sith. Mara shut down as many systems as she could afford to do without, and waited. The temptation to launch a spread of proton torpedoes took some resisting, but until Mara worked out what Lumia was waiting for, the Sith had a stay of execution. It had to be Jason that Lumia had followed, although how she'd managed that, Mara wasn't yet sure. Maybe Tenel Ka had summoned him, to intercede and get him to drop that stupid warrant on his parents. That didn't explain Lumia riding escort, though, or why she'd tailed him for eighteen solid hours. It was staring Mara in the face, whatever it was. She knew that. She was missing a piece again. But all she needed was to locate Jason, not work out his pension plan. I could just calm Tenel Ka and ask. However tightly the Hapens controlled access to their space, a thirteen-meter piece of stealth technology drifting between planets was just a speck of dust. Mara was effectively hidden, and so was Jason. If he was on the surface, she might, just might, detect him when he took off for a moment. But that meant going active and attracting attention. Think. Think. She could wait until he re-entered the Perlemian trade route, but that made the assumption that he was returning to Coruscant the way he came. I don't have infinite oxygen, either. There was an easy solution, but it would blow her cover. An hour later, she was ready to use it. She opened the secure comlink and readied herself for a little social engineering. Hapen Fleet Ops, this is GA Stealth X-5 Alpha requesting assistance. That would cause a flap, but it had to be done. Five Alpha, this is Hapen Fleet Ops. We don't like surprises, even from allies. Oops. This was Paranoid Country. Apologies, Fleet. I'd like to stay off the chart, but can you confirm that Chief of State Solo is unharmed and that his vessel is undamaged? There was a brief silence. Knowing Hapen Fleet Ops, they were checking her out to be sure she was a GA pilot and that her transponder, now obligingly active, matched their security code list. Confirmed, Five Alpha. His ship landed in the Fountain Palace compound without incident. Should we be aware of any special security issues? 
Ah, definitely visiting Tenel Ka then. Probably explaining himself. Believe me, your royal highness, I had no choice. I had to depose Omus. Fleet, he's not aware that we have concerns for his safety, and that we've put close protection on him in transit. He thinks he can handle it himself. Discretion on your part would ensure he doesn't try to shake me. I've detected a vessel following him, but I lost it in your space. Unknown origin, ten-meter red sphere with distinctive ocular front view screen and cruciform masts and vanes. Mara's warning displays were lighting up. Now that the Hapens had a fix on her transmission, they were checking out the Stalfex with sensors while they had the chance. She could have blocked them, but she let them probe around to keep them happy. Understood, Five Alpha. We'll give you a heads up when he makes a move. If we detect the sphere, do you want us to detain or neutralize? Your space, she said. Have this with my very best wishes, Lumia. I have no orders to detain. Feel free to neutralize. Copy that, Five Alpha. Unless you flash us in the meantime, we won't ping you until the Chief of State takes off. They were such nice, helpful people, the Hapens, even if they were paranoid. And they understood plots, assassins, and keeping their mouths shut. Mara shut down all non-criticals and meditated in darkness, marveling anew at how very vivid and exquisitely beautiful starscapes were without the gauzy filter of an atmosphere. She allowed herself one quick glance at her datapad to reassure herself that there was one thing she didn't have to worry about. Ben's transponder said he was still safely on Coruscant. G.A.G. Shuttle, Tanab Space Ben had learned a lot from his G.A.G. comrades about tailing suspects discreetly, and one basic trick was to overshoot an exit and double back. He dropped out of hyperspace and headed back coreward to Tanab, not Hapes, even though he was sure the Sith Sphere was there. He could feel it, but he couldn't detect it conventionally. He could have spoken to it, but he stayed shut down in the Force to avoid Lumia's attention. He tried to work out why she was interested in Hapes and failed. But there was nothing of Jason that he could feel, just a trace of his own mother. The closer he ventured toward Hape in space, the more powerful her presence became. Don't tell me we're both following Lumia. He'd have some explaining to do. But it didn't matter. He'd happily take being grounded for a year, and even sent to Ossus, as long as he could keep an eye on his mom right now. He set a course for the freight corridor, and dropped out into real space again, merging with the convoys of transports, then with a group of ore haulers. Running a loop had also served another purpose. Almost like listening to the source of a sound, Ben made a mental map of the silent voice of the Sith Sphere, and got a good sense of where it was in physical space. It was close to Hapes itself. And, he felt it now, so was his mother. She'd found Lumia then. She'd beaten him to the target. Ben savored a brief fantasy of emptying the shuttle's cannon into the sphere, felt strangely sorry to destroy the ship just to finish Lumia, and wondered if all boys went through a stage of feeling aggressively protective toward their mothers— Maybe that went with finding it so hard to deal with fathers as you grew up. It was that alpha male thing. Come off it. How many guys your age, or any age, have to worry about their family being attacked by Sith and insane dark Jedi? This isn't normal life. The rules are different. Ben got as close to the Sith sphere as he dared. As far as he could tell, it was holding its position. But when it moved, he'd go for the kill. Then his mom would know he was there, whether he made himself detectable in the Force or not, because the G.A.G. shuttle was about as stealthy as a brick. 
If he could avoid killing the Sith ship, he would. For some reason it bothered him more than killing a real human being, which he'd done too many times now. Fountain Palace. Hapes. Jason said goodbye to Alana, finding it freshly painful not to be able to call her his little girl. Nice fur, she said. She refused to be parted from the stuffed tauntaun, and hugged it to her with both arms. What's his name? Jason squatted down level with her. She was force-sensitive and smart, but if she'd realized who he actually was, she was too well-schooled in survival to say. He liked to think that it was a knowledge they both shared, and that she understood why he couldn't be daddy. Not yet, anyway. It was a sobering thought for such a little girl. What do you want to call him? Jason. That's lovely. Why Jason, sweetie? So when you don't come to see us, I can talk to him instead. A father's guts were made to be twisted. Jason reached the stage of wanting to just turn and run when he took his leave of her and Tenel Ka, so he could avoid that hesitant parting a step at a time, looking back over and over again and thinking, what if this was the last time I ever saw them? He did think it. It was morbid, but a measure of how important they were to him that he tested just how devastated he'd feel without them. At least as chief of state, he had a much better reason for more frequent contact with an allied monarch. And he'd come through this visit without his destiny bursting in and creating a moment that told him he had to kill them. He listened for that whisper of fate, dreading it, but there was only silence. It would only have caused him pain. Nothing more. Sith ways were logical, never pointlessly cruel. Whatever sacrifice he still had to make, it would have productive meaning, however hard. Jason, the Tauntaun, who was there for Alana when he wasn't around, would always hurt a little, though. Tenel Ka walked with him in silence to the stealth X in the compound. You're not happy about Omis, are you? he said. She did that gracious tilt of the head, the one she must have learned to cover her real reaction when she was being bored senseless by guests at a diplomatic reception. It's very different being the focus of government after you've enjoyed the relative freedoms of being a deputy, she said. I hope it doesn't turn out to be a mistake for you. I can always steer the attention to Neothel. Make sure you both have different ambitions. It's far safer than both wanting the same thing. That sounds like the kind of advice I should wake up sweating about in the small hours. I think the phrase is lonely at the top, Jason Solo. She indicated the blaster, lightsaber, vibroblade, and toxin darts in the belt around his waist. I see you're getting used to the hapen level of mistrust. Like you say, it's lonely. He didn't look back this time. Now that his brief respite was over, the fresh memory of Mara haranguing him, had he handled it right? Did she have enough on him to destroy all he was working for? Flooded back in, along with Ben's face. I want it over with. I can deal with it. I just can't stand not knowing where and when and how. The stealth X lifted clear, and Hapes dwindled into a sumptuous quilt of gardens and canals again. He had a good idea now of what he'd face when Ben was gone. Mara, an animal robbed of her young, with all the primeval wounded rage that went with it. And Luke. He had no idea how Luke would react, only that a man who could bring down the Empire, 
and whose blood was closer to Vader's even than his own, wouldn't be paralyzed by grief. Jason was now more afraid of the Skywalkers discovering Alana's parentage than of the Hapen nobles. He could probably protect her from the Hapens if he had to, but it would be far harder to protect her from the vengeance of Luke or Mara. Alana was his weak point. But nobody knew, and it would stay that way until he was certain he'd eliminated every threat she might face. He wasn't taking chances. He was going to create two of the most lethal enemies any being could have. Hapen Fleet Ops to Stealth X-1-1. Safe return, said the voice on the comm. They had never said that before. Being Chief of State had obviously upped their anxiety status to triple red or something. But he was perfectly safe here. He was still visible in the Force, still all warmed, bittersweet feelings, and for a little while he could afford not to care. As Jason accelerated toward the hyperjump point, he could have sworn a vessel was close to him. He felt something in the Force for a moment, but it was gone again. He checked his instruments. Nothing. If the Hapes Cluster hadn't been such a maze of hazards, he'd have jumped the moment he passed the planet's upper atmosphere. It must be something in the Hapen water. You were never this jumpy. But there was something out there. And while he hated the imprecision of the phrase, something dark, that was the best he could do. Something hostile that was trying hard not to be. He hoped it was Hapen, and that they were just trying in vain to track him out of their space. He should have been able to sense that clearly, though. An ordinary vessel flown by ordinary people. This wasn't ordinary. He planned for the worst. If he angled the stealth X right and shut down the head-up display he could see a panoramic rear view reflected in the viewscreen. Sometimes he needed to see with his eyes to be certain. He killed the display and shifted his focus, and for a moment all he saw was velvet void. Then the stars winked out. Lumia? Silence. She could hide in the Force, too. She thought he was letting his concentration wander. She probably couldn't resist finding out where he was going. If she'd followed him here, then she knew about Tenel Ka. She'd use it. It's okay, Lumia. I know it's you. But there was still no response. That wasn't like her. Lumia. I can't let you live now. You realize that? For a moment, even in this crisis, he found himself measuring her death against his prophecy. Was it Lumia, after all? Was she the sacrifice? What could there possibly be about her death that would kill something he loved? Lumia... Last chance. Then a searing white beam flooded his cockpit and blinded him for a second. He rolled instinctively to break, suddenly aware it was a landing light so close on his tail that the vessel must have nearly collided with him. How did the proximity sensors miss it? How did he miss it? His force senses were flooded instantly with someone else's ice-cold anger. The calm crackled. Game over, Lumia he said, targeting his aft cannon. You bet it is, said Mara. Chapter 19 She logged out 5 Alpha at 0036 hours, sir, and she didn't file a flight plan. G.A. Stealth X Technician Coruscant to Luke Skywalker Hapes Cluster Jason couldn't fire. It wasn't regard for Mara, because his first instinct was to lock on and press the button. 
but she was so close that the detonation would have taken him with her. Stealth X's had sacrificed shielding for sensor negators. It was only at times like this, times that should never have happened, would never have happened, that it was a problem. He jinked left, and she matched him, and right, and left, and still she was so close on his tail that he braced for impact out of reflex, arms locked out on the yoke. There was no advantage. Same starfighter. No edge. She was as good a pilot. No refuge. They were in open space. It was down to who hated more, and who was more prepared to die to take out the other. All Jason could think of was that now it was Mara who'd followed him here and knew about Tenel Ka. Her threats over Ben seemed irrelevant. He had a whole new problem. His calm crackled again. He braced for a stream of vitriol from his aunt. But it was someone else's voice. I have her, Jason. Lumia. Savior, maybe. But she shouldn't have been here either. So Lumia and Mara probably knew about Tenel Ka and Alana. And Lumia certainly knew that he couldn't let either woman live with that knowledge. Now he had two assassins on his tail, and he couldn't trust either of them not to kill or betray him. Laser cannons flared across his port side, and he felt the impact in the airframe, but he was still in one piece. He smelled smoke. Brilliant white light filled the cockpit. Lumia, if she was targeting Mara, if she wasn't trying to kill him in some bizarre Sith test, had the same problem. Mara was flying so close that any explosion put him in her blast radius, or would send her debris punching through his shields at this range. Jason did what he'd done many times. He simply dropped away by looping through ninety degrees. He needed to put a second of space between them, and he also needed to come back at her with an advantage. Mara might have sent a message to Luke by now, revealing everything. She wanted maximum damage. His secret was as good a missile to be used against him as any ordnance. As he climbed out of the loop, Jason looked up through the canopy, desperate for any reflection or hint of movement. Stealth X's had never been designed to fight one another. Their almost complete lack of sensor trace made tracking Mara impossible. That was why she was so close on his tail, too. They couldn't detect each other reliably, except through the Force, or by spotting silhouettes against the starfield. And Mara seemed to be able to dip in and out of the Force just like him. Just like Ben. He should never have taught Ben to do it. The fact that Mara hadn't said more than four words was the most disorienting thing of all. Now he needed to get her onto ground of his choosing. He could feel Lumia somewhere off to starboard, moving at high speed, and he had no idea what the Sith Sphere was capable of in her hands. All he knew was that it was obsolete, and old tech and brute force could often bypass more complex systems. Canopy, he yelled. Ben's report had said he'd used a magnetic accelerator in the Sith Sphere. Lumia, crack her canopy! Weak shields! He didn't have to explain it to her. Suddenly he could see an orange ball accelerating toward him on a collision course, and he flipped ninety degrees just in time for it to pass under him. The next thing he heard was Lumia's voice saying, Hull breach! She's venting atmosphere! As Jason came around again in a loop, orienting by feeling Mara in the force once more, he could see a thin white trail moving at high speed toward the center of the cluster. Mara was hit. A slow leak either in the canopy or straight through the skin into the cockpit. And she was trying to land before a crack spread and became an explosive decompression. 
even with a flight suit, her chances of surviving that were slim. She was heading for Cavan. That suited Jason fine. Once he had her on the ground, he could take her. Because even if she called in support, who would respond to someone in a battle with Jason Solo? Not the Hapens. Who would believe her? People many hours away. He felt no violence or malice at all. But then he never did in combat. He just felt an overwhelming desire to win and survive, and all other emotions were pushed into the background. He turned his attention to Lumia. It's okay, Jason, she said. I know what you have to keep secret. I'll make sure it stays that way. You certainly will, he said and locked all eight proton torpedoes on the Sith Sphere. This is what you taught me to be. Jason fired on her, and felt no triumph or shame, only temporary relief. But he saw no explosion, no white-hot ball or glittering cloud of slow-tumbling debris. His onboard sensors picked up nothing. Where was she? Was it a kill or not? He'd have to trawl for wreckage later. Right now, his priority was to silence Mara Jade Skywalker. Hape in space. Ben couldn't feel his mother, but he knew she wasn't dead. She was hiding, just as he'd taught her. Lumia was here in the Sith ship, though streaking away on his starboard side, and he wasn't going to break off the pursuit now. She was the key to this. She'd be the key, dead or alive. Ben knew he was capable of doing either. The ship was speaking inside his head, just as it had before. It might have been talking to itself, or addressing both him and Lumia, but it was deeply unhappy. He has tried to cause irreparable damage. Ship, shut up, Lumia said. Ben could hear her, too, as if the ship's thought processes were an open circuit. He has to survive. We don't. The rule of ages is that I must not be targeted. The sphere had clearly decided enough was enough and looped back in the direction from which it had come. Ben could see it in his forward screens and on sensors, but he could also see it in his head. The general impression was that it was rolling up its sleeves and going back to knock ten bells out of whoever had fired on it. Ship, break off! I do what I must. Ship! Ben's drives were screaming, trying to keep up with it. There was no real up or down in space, but it was like plummeting in the slipstream of a raptor. Ship, my mom's down there, Ben pleaded. She didn't fire on you. Masters may use their ships to fight, but not involve apprentices. Ship, Jason made an error. Do it for me, so I can find my mom again. Please. Don't fire! The sphere decelerated dramatically. Who is the enemy? The ship asked. Unless I know, I can do nothing except evade and protect. That's right, Ben said. Shevu had told him that humoring nutters, as he called it, was an essential police skill. Keeping them talking was what it was all about. And if Ben had the ship, he had Lumia. Ship, what's your task? Once I fought. Now I educate and protect apprentices. What do you believe I am? Apprentice. Who's the one within you now? Apprentice also. Ben was starting to form a picture of the sphere's view of the world. 
it had been buried on Zeost for centuries, and possibly millennia. It had reacted to him when he was being targeted from orbit and running for his life with a terrified little girl. Ship, what do you mean? Educate. I teach apprentices to fight. Ben could sense Lumia communicating with it. The ship was responding strongly in his mind, but there was a second stream of soundless words running almost like interference on a comlink from overlapping frequencies. She was urging the sphere to fire on Ben, to ram his shuttle, to kill him. Yes, I am now for apprentices, so they learn and come to no harm. I used to be for masters at war. It made sudden sense to Ben. You're a Sith training vessel. It would see him as an apprentice, because he was one, in a way. But Lumia confused him. Why do you think the woman in you now is an apprentice? Because she knows so little of me. Like you. Ben accepted he wasn't an intellectual like Jason. But he could grind through options, eliminating things as he went, just like his mom. He could work out anything, just by asking question after question. The woman apprentice in you had us shot at when we left Zeost. We shot back. The ship recognized him, and it decided that both he and Lumia were novices who needed its advice and care. It had stopped his mother from killing Lumia on Hesperidium because that was its job, teaching apprentices to fight. Ben wondered how many chances it gave Sith apprentices before it decided they were weaklings who deserved what they got. There was no way he was going to talk it into killing Lumia. He wondered how it would do that, and she was having no luck getting it to attack him either. Ben was in no real danger, but his mother was, and not from that ship. Someone else wanted her dead. He needed to find her. He dropped toward Reboam, and the Sith Sphere escorted him, with Lumia impotent within. Ben had caught a Sith, and now he had no idea how to use her to his advantage. Cavan, Hapes Cluster Mara set the stealth X down in the middle of nowhere and reminded herself that being the target or the assassin was simply a state of mind. No doubt Jason thought he'd forced her to land so he could finish her off. She thought she'd ditched to get him where she could use her fighting skills to better advantage. It was a matter of who found who first. I can stop this any time I want. After all she'd seen and heard, there was still the Mara within who couldn't really believe her nephew was dangerously and irredeemably evil. If you don't do it, who will? And who'll blame you for not acting while he could be stopped? Palpatine, Palpatine, Palpatine! Your lesson in 2020 hindsight. So here she was, telling herself that she was going to go through a very bad time after she killed him, but it had to be done. And Jason was probably thinking the identical thing. They were the same. No moral high ground, just a leftover equation that said all other things being equal, Mara preferred to see Jason dead than Ben or Luke, or herself. Survival. There was nothing wrong with surviving. Luke now kept reaching out to her in the Force, increasingly anxious, trying to find her, but she didn't dare reach back. There was no telling what Jason could detect. When she wanted to be found by Jason, he'd know all about it. She grabbed her bag and everything from the cockpit that could be used as a weapon, then found some cover while she consulted her datapad for charts and surveys of Cavan. 
It was honeycombed with ruined monuments and tunnels. Fine. If I get him in a confined space, he can't use all his force skills, but I can make the most of what I've got. She decided to make her way into the maze of buried passages and get Jason to follow her. She was nowhere near any centers of population, so she was also a long way from any help. She didn't intend to summon any anyway. Not until it was time to remove the body. She secreted all her weapons in her jacket, belt, and boots, and sprinted for the first tunnel she saw. It was getting easier by the minute to disappear into the force for as long as she needed. But now she needed to be visible a beacon for Jason to lure him onto the rocks. Come and get me, Colonel Solo. Chapter 20 From Sas Sikili, Negotiator of Roche, to Boba Fett, Mandalore Mercana has failed to respond. Because they have failed to respond, and we fear this will encourage others to ignore our patents, we request your support, so that the point may be made that we take our patents seriously. I would very much like to see the Besu leak in action. Our metallurgists have been looking at ways to produce lighter Beskar structures, so when you pound the Mercana factories to dust, we will be inspired to be more inventive. This is very good for business. Jedi Temple, Coruscant Luke met Jaina on the steps of the Jedi Temple. He was dashing out as she was dashing in. He caught her arm and steered her back down the path. Where did she go, Jaina? Uncle Luke, I swear I'm not covering for her. I don't know, and she's not answering any of her links. Why are you worried? Luke held the crumpled flimsy in his fist. Gone hunting for a few days. Mara had signed out a stealth X just after midnight two days before. He shoved the note in his pocket. The feeling of dread overwhelmed him. Come on, he said. I have to go look for her. Something's wrong. And Ben's gone, too. I've had the worst feeling. Like she's walking into a trap. Ben wasn't just missing. Luke could no longer feel him in the Force, and now he couldn't feel Mara. He'd called everyone, including Han and Leia, and he didn't criffing care if the G.A.G. detained him for contacting Corellian agents with a warrant out for their arrest. He expected Jason to show up to issue a warning, but Neothel said Jason was away on business. The G.A.G. Stealth X was gone again. The man came and went as he pleased, it seemed. I can imagine. Jason was permanently invisible in the force now, that was for sure. Luke hailed an air taxi, and they headed for Starfighter Command. I've spent more time there since I left the military than when I was in uniform, Jaina said. Can you feel her, Jaina? Can you feel Mara? She looked slightly to one side of Luke, defocused, and shook her head slowly. Nothing. I haven't felt her now for hours. When they reached Starfighter Command, they headed for the chart room. Luke found that he could look at charts and pick up strong correlations in the Force, something Ben had proved to have a talent for, too. He stood in front of the banks of holocharts and tried to relax enough to let the Force steer his attention. He made an effort to put out of his mind where he thought she might have been heading. After a while, when the glowing lines and clusters of dots began to blur and lose their perspective, he found himself drawn to one sector in particular. I'm sure she's in the Hapes Cluster, he said at last. When Luke had first felt Mara drop out of the Force, it was so sudden and uncontrolled that he thought she'd been killed. It woke him in a panic. The three seconds of pure agonized paralysis lasted until she faded back in again. 
and again, and he worked out that she was doing it deliberately. Ironically, it would have been better if she'd taken a regular X-wing, Jaina said. The Starfighter techies say it's almost impossible to locate a stealth X by any of the usual search methods. She was right. Unless someone happened to eyeball 5-Alpha, or Mara had left a transponder or comlink active, the Starfighter would simply vanish. A visual search was all that was left. That or finding Mara herself. Luke headed for the hangars, and Jaina followed. How do we recover stealth X's that ditch then? Luke asked, trying not to vent his frustration on hard-working ground crew. The technician stepped back from the starfighter. Rescue beacon, or the Mark I pall of smoke and flame, sir, he said warily. The GA asked income to make them very hard to detect, and they did. Okay. I'll stop harassing people with work to do and go out there myself. Luke reminded himself that Mara was hunting Lumia, and so he had to expect her to use every trick in the book. That didn't stop him from worrying. After all, I'm the one who shook Lumia's hand and not her throat. Then Mara was suddenly there, not just back in the force, but magnifying her presence, as if she wanted to be found. She was defiant, unafraid, and spoiling for a fight. She'd found Lumia, all right. Why is she doing that, though? Jaina had her own hunt, for Alima. Now she was keen to help find Mara. It's like she's taunting her. Or she's in trouble, and she wants me to find her. No. Jaina closed her eyes for a moment, concentrating. Doesn't feel like a call for help. Feels like... a fight. Luke decided to warn Tenel Ka that he was on his way, purely as a precaution. Eighteen standard hour transit. Given the number of planets in the Hapes cluster, it would probably take even the Hapens a lot longer than that to find a stealth X. But the more eyes that were out looking for Mara, the better. Luke tried to appear casual as he climbed into his cockpit. Jaina stood looking up at him. I know I'm officially out of the service, she said. But if someone authorizes it, I'm happy to join in. Please? Luke gestured to the ground crew. Thanks. It's Lumia we should be worrying about. Jaina was trying to reassure him. I can see Aunt Mara going in for braided scalps like Fett. Red ones. Does Lumia dye her hair, do you think? Will the stuff have icky gray roots? Luke knew she was trying to make him laugh, and he tried to oblige. But just hearing the name Fett reminded him that pretty well every member of his family, Solos or Skywalkers, was at the top of someone's must-kill-today list. Luke didn't want or expect to be loved by everyone. He just wanted to wake up one morning and find his loved ones left alone to get on with their lives. When Mara came home, scalps or no scalps, war or no war, he was going to book a vacation for the two of them, somewhere soothingly uneventful. He balled the flimsy note she'd left for him and wedged it into a gap in the cockpit fascia. The stealth X's drives wind into life. It wouldn't be Hesperidium, though. Cavan Jason had expected to have to deal with an angry Mara after he killed Ben, not before. He was still looking for meanings and patterns in the events around him, and he now saw in himself a certain desperation to try whatever was placed in his path to see if that did the trick and sealed his Sith status. Will I notice? What does it feel like? How will I know? There had to be something that changed the fabric of the galaxy, a tipping point. 
Meanwhile, Mara was challenging him, pinpointing herself in the tunnels that ran deep under the cavern countryside. Thinking she was still an A-list assassin, and that she could take someone who had complete mastery of the Force. She was a superb assassin, but her Force skills were crude compared to his. Once Jason removed her, it would be easier to deal with Ben. And Luke, he'd cross that bridge when he had to. Jason checked his belt, pockets, and holster, and decided to oblige Mara. Lumia and Ben seemed to be elsewhere, having their own showdown. Now it all fitted. Lumia had to be silenced for what she knew, and Ben would do it. It was tidy. It was a food chain. Jason loaded four poisoned darts into an adapted blaster and slipped the others into slots on his belt, wondering how he could think such things so calmly. He approached the tunnel mouth with slow care. While he could sense the layout, Mara had vanished from the force again. There was about a meter of headroom as he edged carefully along the central tunnel, and he could see horizontal shafts at about hip height branching off. It had been built to drain stormwater. In harsh winters, local Cavani had once made emergency homes down here. Jason stood and listened. Okay, he said. I know you can hear me, Mara. You can still back out of this. His voice echoed. There was no response, just as he expected. So he began walking deeper into the maze of drains, lightsaber in his right hand and blaster in the other. The only light around him now was a green haze from the glowing blade of energy. I could, he said quietly, go back, block the entrance to this complex with flammable material, and set fire to it. She could hear him all right. He could hear water dripping slowly deep in the tunnels. Sound was magnified, even if it was hard to pinpoint the origin. And the fact that these tunnels have vents means the chimney effect would smoke you out, asphyxiate you, or barbecue you. Silence. He held his breath, listening. Crack! His right knee exploded with blinding pain as Mara cannoned out horizontally, force assisted from a side conduit, and caught his leg on the joint with her boots, ripping the tendons. As he lost his footing in the narrow passage, screaming, he found himself wedged for a second and groping for support. He lashed out with his lightsaber, shaving powdery brick from the wall. Mara dropped to the muddy floor to dodge the lightsaber, then sprang up and sprinted away down the tunnel. It wasn't a good start. Jason swore and made himself run after her, willing endorphins to numb his leg and telling himself that he knew she was setting up a trap. She wanted him confined, pinned down, penned. If she thought tunnels would even the odds, she was wrong. He'd bury her here. Mara found the perfect trap at the end of one of the culverts. She could hear Jason's running footsteps, and she had a good fifty meters on him. From here the vaulted ceiling became lower, and even Mara had to run at a crouch. It wasn't the place to swing a standard lightsaber. The tunnels were in poor condition, and the brick arches were starting to sag and collapse in places— so he wouldn't oblige her by revealing his physical position in the force. Fine. She spotted a rusty metal sheet about a half meter wide and laid it carefully across the tunnel floor, propped on stones so he'd tread on it and give her an audible warning when he reached that point. An intense force shake of the brickwork and arches in front and behind the metal plate weakened them, 
and then she stopped them from collapsing by force pressure. Hold him up. Wait for him to hit that plate. Going after Jason would never work. He could never be allowed to set the agenda. He could come after her. Trap. Immobilize. Kill. It wasn't pretty, and it wouldn't capture the public's imagination like a lightsaber display at the Academy, but her training was in destruction. Jason's was in deception. She could hear him breathing, and the irregular vzm, vzm, vzm of his lightsaber as he stalked, jumping and turning to be sure she wasn't behind him. Then she could hear that he wasn't swinging the blade so much. The short staccato hums and buzzes told her he was running out of room. She was trapped, too, of course, unless she counted the ventilation shafts every fifty meters. But when she said she was leaving here over his dead body, she meant it. She felt the beginning of a compassionate human thought about Leia, but killed it stone dead. It would weaken her. Jason's boots crunched over bricks. He was impatient. She was in his way, holding him up when he wanted to get on with something. Crunch. 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 If she'd timed it right, he was close to stepping on that rusty plate. Clang! The rumbling began. She brought down both sections of tunnel, before and behind, with a massive exertion in the force that made her breathless. She didn't hear him call out. Even in the damp conditions, clouds of fine debris filled the air and made her choke. Mara waited, one hand over her mouth and nose, Shoto drawn, and listened in the force. There was whimpering and the chunk-chunk sound of the last falling bricks. She didn't expect that weight of debris from a low ceiling to cause impact injury, but to engulf and immobilize him. He wouldn't be dead. Yet. She waited in silence, a non-existent presence herself, until she could hear no more movement. Okay. Let's see what I have to do to end this. An arm was all that protruded from the rubble. Through a fist-sized gap she could see the wet, blinking glint of an eye and blood-stained face. A hand reached out to her, fingers splayed, bloody and shaking. Other people might have felt an urge to take that hand, the most distinctively human of things. But it was an old, tired Sith stunt, and she'd used it herself too many times. She took her blaster and leveled it at the eye, one-handed, forefinger resting on the trigger. She had the Shoto ready in case a coup de grace was called for. She felt as detached and steady as she'd ever been as the Emperor's hand. Tell my mom. I'm sorry I failed her, Jason whispered. She knows, Mara said, and squeezed the trigger. Chapter 21 New Kiradish She Tabechajla Not gone, merely marching far away. Mandalorian phrase for the departed. Cavan. They said that the human body was capable of extraordinary feats of strength when in extremis. For a Jedi, it was something else entirely. Jason Solo wasn't ready to die. Not now. Not so close to his ascendance. And not in a stinking drain like vermin. He deflected the energy bolt with one last surge of the force and sent the rubble erupting off his crushed and bleeding body like a detonation. Bricks hammered the walls and rained fragments, 
knocking Mara flat like a bomb blast. She made an animal noise that was more anger than pain and flailed for a moment as she tried to get up. The effort froze Jason for two vital seconds. But he knew if he didn't get up now and fight back, Mara would come in for the kill again and again until he was worn down and too weak to fend her off. He scrambled to his feet, staggering more than standing, and suddenly understood. It was Mara who had to die to fulfill his destiny. Killing her was the test. The words of the prophecy were meaningless, and at a visceral level he knew that her death was the pivotal act. He didn't know how, and this wasn't the time to stop and think about it. He surrendered totally to instinct for the first time in ages. Whatever guided a Sith's hand had to guide him now. But he was hurt, and badly. Ben. He didn't know where Ben fitted into this. But now he knew he did, as surely as he knew anything. Jason didn't care, because he knew he had to kill Mara now, and nothing else would make sense until he did that. He fumbled for his lightsaber and thumbed it into life again. Mara was already back on her feet, coming at him with the shoto and vibroblade, brick dust and black-red blood snaking down her forehead from a scalp cut. She leapt at him with the shoto held left-handed, fencing style, seared the angle of his cheekbone, and caught him under the tip of the chin with the vibroblade as he jerked back. She shouldn't have been able to get near him. He had total mastery, and she was just athletic and fast. He pushed back at her in the force, sending her crashing against a wall with a loud grunt. But she kept coming at him. One, two. One, two, with the shoto and the blade. And he was being driven back, his strength ebbing. He needed space to fight. He drew his dart gun and fired one after the other. But Mara scattered all four needles in a blur of blue light. They fell to the ground. He turned and scrambled through the collapsed brick, using the force to hurl debris up at her from the floor of the passage while she leapt from block to boulder to chunk of masonry until she force-leapt onto his back and brought him down. They rolled. This wasn't a duel. It was a brawl. She thrust her vibroblade up under his chin, and he jerked his head to one side, feeling the tip skate from his jaw to his hairline as it missed his jugular. He couldn't draw the weapons he needed. He was losing blood, losing strength, waning, flailing his lightsaber to fend her off. It was almost useless in such a close-quarters struggle. Mara, manic and panting, flicked the shoto to counter every desperate stabbing thrust. Ben, I'll see you dead first, before you get Ben. Jason was on the knife edge between dying and killing. They grappled, force-pushed, force-crushed. He threw her back again, trying to force-jolt her spine and paralyze her for a moment. But somehow she deflected it, and bricks flew out of the wall as if someone had punched them through from the other side. She almost force-snatched the lightsaber from his hand, but even with his injuries he hung on to it. He wouldn't die. He couldn't. Not now. You can't beat me, he gasped. It's not meant to be. Really? Mara snarled. I say it is. Then she launched herself at him, unthinking a wild woman, hair flying, and he force-pushed to send her slamming against a pillar in mid-leap. But the battering he'd taken, and the ferocity of her relentless attack, had blinded him to danger from another quarter. As he lurched backward to avoid her, his legs went from under him, and he stumbled into a gaping crack opened up by the subsidence. He fell badly. Red-hot pain seared from ankle to knee. His lightsaber went flying. Pain could be ignored, but...
but the moment it took him to get to his feet again was enough for Mara to right herself and come back at him with the shodo and plunge it into the soft tissue just under the end of his collarbone. Lightsaber wounds hurt a lot more than he ever imagined. Jason screamed. He summoned his own weapon back to his hand, and Mara crashed into him, knocking him flat again and pinning him down. Her vibra-blade stopped a handspan from his throat as he managed to grab her hair and drag her face nearer and nearer to his lightsaber. She struggled to pull back, hacking at him with a shoto, but blocked by his dwindling force power each time. Her vibra-blade grazed his neck. He fumbled in his belt for a dart. She jerked back with a massive effort, leaving him clutching a handful of red hair and the only thing that crossed his mind as she arched her back and held her arms high to bring both Shoto and Vibrablade down into his chest was that she would never, ever harm Ben. Jason stared into her eyes and instantly created the illusion of Ben's face beneath her. She blinked. It gave him the edge for that fraction of a moment. It was long enough to ram the poison dart into her leg, with its protective plastoid cone still in place. It was just a small needle, ten centimeters long. He stabbed her so hard that the sharp end punched through the cone and the fabric of her pants. Mara gasped and looked down at her leg as if she was puzzled rather than hurt. The dart quivered as she moved, and then fell to the floor. Oh, it's done, Jason said. The shoto fell from her hand, and she made a vague and uncontrolled pawing movement with the vibra-blade. It caught him in the bicep, but there was no strength behind the blow, and she dropped the weapon. I'm sorry, Mara. Had to be you. Thought it was Ben. But it's over now. It's over. What have you done? What the stang have you done to me? But she was already losing her balance as the poison paralyzed her, and she slumped to one side as he got to his feet staring up at him more with shock than rage or fear. The prophecy. It didn't matter now. The toxin, complex, relatively painless, was circulating through her body. Don't fight it. No healing trance. Just let go. Mara tried to get up, but sank back to sit on her heels, with an expression as if she'd forgotten something and was trying to remember. She crumpled against the wall. Jason had never felt such relief. It didn't have to be Alana, or Tenel Ka, or even Ben. It was over. All over. What? Mara said. She tried to put her fingers to her lips, shaking, but her hand fell back to her lap. She looked at them as if expecting to see blood. Jason suppressed his instinct to help her. It's my destiny, Mara, to be a Sith Lord and bring order and justice. I had to kill you to do it. You're going to save so many people, Mara. You've saved Ben. You've saved Alana, too. It's not a waste. Believe me. You're as vile as he was. Jason could hardly understand what she was saying. Who? Palpatine. It's not like that, he said, 
He had to make her see what was happening. It was important. He owed her that revelation. She'd made the sacrifice. Although he was now starting to wonder what that meant for whatever love he had to give up. It's not about ambition. It's about the galaxy. About peace. It's about building a different world. She stared back at him. And now he could see and feel her disgust. He wasn't sure if it was aimed at him or at herself. Jason hurt. He was starting to feel the full extent of his injuries, and he needed to heal himself. He also needed to get out of this tunnel. Mara was breathing heavily now, one hand slack in her lap, but the other still clenching and unclenching, as if trying to form a fist to give him one final punch. Her vivid green eyes were still bright with relentless purpose. He knew he would try to forget them every day of his life. You think... you've won, she said, slurred, but utterly lucid and unafraid. But Luke will crush you, and I refuse... To let you destroy the future for my Ben. Jason sat and waited, almost expecting a prophecy from her to help him make sense of what he'd done. But after a few moments, he felt the final discharge of elemental energy that every Force user would notice and comprehend. Ben was the last word she ever spoke. Cavan Lumia felt the Force shift subtly like tectonic plates in motion. She hadn't realized that the decisive moment would feel quite like that. Ship, she said. The new Dark Lord needs me. Follow him. Then she left to prepare for death, intending to die well. Cavan. Ben suddenly couldn't hear the voice of the Sith Sphere. His own name, Ben, Ben, Ben drowned out every other sound, even though deep in his head. It was quieter than a whisper, a summons and a farewell for him alone. He forgot about Lumia, and stumbled toward the source of the voice, blinded by tears. Mom! he yelled. Mom! Perlemian Trade Route In the cockpit of his stealth X heading for Hapes, Luke Skywalker felt a hand brush his hair, and as he reached out involuntarily to touch it, he knew his world had ended. Chapter 22 I don't know what's happening, Mondalore, but the amount of secure GA com traffic flying around the Hapen cluster now has to be seen to be believed. Major panic ongoing. Stand by. Goran Bevin, surveillance expert, reporting back from the nearby Roche asteroid field prior to launch of the Besulik. GAG Stealth X, laid up on Zeost. Jason really didn't know where else to go. He stared at the cockpit panel facing him, knowing that he should have been back on Coruscant at least twenty hours ago, and that Neothel would be cursing him roundly. He was alone, increased black fatigues, in agonizing pain, and hungry. This wasn't the ascension of the Lord of the Sith that he'd expected. He wondered what ordinary people thought happened when the course of history swung on a single pivotal act. They probably didn't envisage that their future was now in the hands of a tired, sweaty man 
who kept thinking he needed a shave, and almost unable to believe that he'd killed Mara Jade Skywalker. Killing didn't get any easier. He was just getting better at it. But it still didn't make sense. He rubbed his cheek, and the stubble rasped audibly under his fingers. Mara hadn't been the most precious thing in his life. In recent weeks, she'd changed from being his only friend to just someone else who didn't trust him and was getting in his way. She was his aunt. She was family. When his role in her death became known, it had to be when. But not now. Not any time soon. The shock and hatred would tear apart what was left of the Skywalker and Solo families. Maybe even Neothel and all the others who understood that securing peace was a dirty business would be disgusted. I just killed my aunt. I grew up with her. She was there for me. We fought a war together. I have to face her son. I have to face Ben. What have I done? His stomach rumbled. How could he possibly be hungry at a time like this? He will immortalize his love. Stupid knotted tassels. All kinds of ancient Sith prophecies that would come to pass when the new Dark Lord was ready to take up his mantle and usher in a golden age of justice, order, and peace. The key had been turned, and this was what the prophecy was supposed to mean, by Jason killing what he most loved. He'd killed Mara, and Nelani, and Fett's daughter, and chaotic, unjust democracy. And he loved none of those. He'd tried to kill Lumia more than once. She seemed to think that was part of the job description for Sith acolytes. So Jason didn't believe it. And if Mara hadn't been trying to kill him to begin with, he would have seen it even more as a life thrown carelessly away. The fabric of existence didn't seem to have changed enough. That shift should have been cataclysmic, and although he was too much of a pragmatist to think he could raise his fists to the sky and call down lightning to energize a mighty soul, he expected to be able to taste the spiritual and existential transformation. He was afraid. However certain he'd been a few hours ago that Mara was to be the one destined to die— it didn't make sense in the context of the prophecy. He didn't feel different, either. Did that mean he still had to kill someone else? He'd been so certain it would be all over now. The sense of anticlimax was almost enough to make him sob. Then he felt a presence. He leaned his head against the side of the cockpit canopy and gazing up at him from the nightmarish planet surrounding his fighter was Lumia. Jason popped the seal. I'm surprised you could be bothered to come and find me, after what happened. You now need to be seen. Lumia had a new serenity about her. As ever, she still seemed to take no offense at him for trying to kill her again. Your new existence has started, Dark Lord. Really? The pain in his shoulder gnawed at him like an animal tearing his flesh. I don't feel very lordly. I assure you it's done. I felt it. She might have been humoring him. He shifted in his seat to ease the assortment of bruises. I'll be looking for further proof. Stop arguing with the Force, and pay attention to what you have to do next. Luke Skywalker arrived at Hapes a couple of hours ago, and they're looking for evidence. And Neothel is griping bitterly about your being AWOL. They won't find me. 
That's not what I mean. Your trip to the royal court, a subject I will take to my grave, by the way, needs to be smoothed out in terms of credibility. Sooner or later it'll emerge that you were in the Hapes Cluster, and that Mara knew that. How? May I alarm you? Can you alarm me any more? Is it possible? Mara had a conversation with Hapen Fleet Ops, while in Hapen space, about your presence on Hapes. I intercepted it, which is one reason why I was able to come to your aid. Wonderful. And she even gave them a description of the Sith Sphere as a possible hostel. I think that stacks up to a scenario needing a plausible explanation. Lumia was right. Jason needed a cover story, if only for Tenel Ka. This is going to tax even my creativity, Jason said. How widely known is this? There are no secrets in the galaxy, Jason. Only varying sizes of distribution lists. The Bothans will have it. The Mandalorians will have it. And Alliance Intel will have it. And they don't love you at all these days. Well, if I weren't a Sith Lord fresh out of the box, I'd be borked. Don't joke. Never joke about this. I could say quite legitimately that I was visiting Tenel Ka as chief of state because of the continuing embarrassment about my parents. And what about your wretched physical state? Ah, I'm hastening the healing trance as much as I can. What about Mara's body? I left it where it was. She didn't become discorporeal? She left her remains? I think so. Does that surprise you? Lumia seemed to consider something, breaking her intense gaze. I always thought she'd become one with the Force, somehow. Well, who knows? And here I am about to say they'll never trace the poison back to me. But does it matter? One day soon they'll all have to know. And by then it'll be too late for them to do anything to you. Lumia turned as if to walk away, and then seemed to change her mind. My ship has been noted. Ben didn't see you on Cavan, and I'm almost certainly the prime suspect for Mara's death. This all enables me to do the last service I can for you. Which is? Lumia's most unnerving state was when she was being gracious. It told Jason that she knew something he didn't. To buy you time to consolidate your hold on the galaxy, she said, by making Luke believe it was all my doing. Don't you think you should be hiding from him? No. You might say that's my destiny. That smacks of a death wish. My work and my life are done, Jason. I'd really welcome a rest. Death. Seemed a very routine commodity lately. Jason wasn't comfortable with that. He had a sudden urge to embrace life. Deep in him, for all the boy inside that still expected a lightning bolt to mark his passage into Sith maturity, there was a feeling of optimism, green and fresh. It took him aback. By the way, Alima is still prowling, Lumia said. If you spot her, she'll probably be coveting the Sith ship to pursue her vendetta against your parents. I have no doubt you'll see her around. Jason wondered if Sith left wills. Lumia certainly seemed to have thought hers through. She studied him with her head on one side for a while, 
eyes disturbingly green and not unlike Mara's. And then she walked away into the icy fog. He meditated for an hour or so to hasten the healing process, and then set off for Coruscant, via Hapes. Fountain Palace, Hapes Luke? Luke? Luke! Tenel Ka had to repeat his name three times before he could manage to lift his head to look at her. The elegant brocade sofa felt as if it were swallowing him whole, and maybe that would have been for the best. There was an insulating gauze of numbness holding Luke together, and it took triple repetition to penetrate it. The first to stop him thinking that he hadn't even said goodbye to Mara and was asleep when she left, the second to stop him racking his brains for the last words he'd said to her, which he couldn't recall, and the third to stop him seeing in his mind's eye her scribbled note that he'd balled up and used to plug a hole in his cockpit console, and that he had now lovingly smoothed flat and would keep with him for the rest of his life. Gone hunting for a few days. Don't be mad at me, farm boy. Luke, Jane is here. Thank you, Tenelka. As long as he stayed numb, Luke felt he would function. He would gather his thoughts, see that the rest of the family was coping, and then he'd act. When he knew what to do. I can't thank you enough. Luke, I have all my guard deployed searching the cluster. Jaina walked in briskly, face grim and eyes a little swollen. She dropped down on her knees and pressed herself into Luke's lap, cuddling him in silence. He hadn't really needed to call. They'd all felt it. Still no sign of Ben, Luke said, stroking Jaina's hair. And I can't even guess where he is. Jaina knelt back on her heels. I can't feel him either, Uncle Luke. He'll be okay, sweetheart. I'd know if... Luke didn't finish the sentence. He knew now exactly how Ben's death would feel to him in the Force. Ben wasn't dead. Luke waited for a call back from Leia and Han. He knew Leia had sensed Mara's passing. After that moment, when he'd felt the lightest of touches on his hair, and he turned his head, he'd had the sensation of meeting Leia's eyes. She'd call. He'd keep calling anyway. Tenel Ka's regal composure flickered for a moment. Jason was here, earlier. What? Jaina suddenly regained that edge in her voice. What do you mean, here? He paid a visit yesterday, Tenel Ka said. I don't know where he is now, but would Hapen Fleet Ops have logged his vessel's movements? asked Jaina. Any scrap of information might help. Jason must have felt the death like anyone else, and there was a good chance he'd actually been here while Mara was pursuing Lumia in this very system. But he was busy on G.A.G. business. Luke seethed in silence. Tenel Ka nodded, all gracious calm again. I'll have the captain get all the available information for you. Tenel Ka strode out. Jaina's expression was murderous. Don't say it, said Luke. He's a total stranger, Jaina said. There. I had to, or else I'll have an aneurysm trying to stifle the urge to punch him out when he finally bothers to show up. Luke hugged Jaina, feeling dwarfed by the grand stateroom, and his comlink buzzed. It was Leia. Hey, she said. Leia didn't just touch him in the Force. She enveloped him. We're coming back as fast as we can. 
I'm so sorry. I am so, so sorry. It sounded as if Han had wrestled the link from her. Kid, you just hang in there. Don't do a thing. Leave it all to us. Is Ben okay? Missing again. He'll be fine. Don't you worry. We're coming. There wasn't much else Han could say, and he never mentioned Jason. Luke put his comm link back in his pocket. The silence felt like pressure building on his eardrums. His breathing seemed to fill the room. What was the last thing I said to her? You know pretty well the last thing Mara and I talked about, Jaina said suddenly. She was doing exactly what he was, replaying final conversations. Tears welled in her eyes. Nothing important, like how much I loved her and what she'd done for me, just how much energy I waste in stupid games with Zack and Jag, like a dumb sulky teenager. Don't do this to yourself. Takes this to make me grow up. Jaina didn't seem able to say the words, Mara's death. Everything's changed now. I know. I know. It's Lumia. We don't know that. You're reasonable to the last, aren't you, Uncle Luke? None of us is thinking straight at the moment. He didn't need Jaina going off on an impulsive quest for vengeance. He had to focus. Somehow. Why don't you call... Zek? Jag? He hadn't a clue which of the two men she'd want to turn to now. They need to know, too. Jaina brushed the tip of her nose discreetly with the back of her wrist and seemed to take an unnaturally fixed interest in the ornate carvings on a chair leg nearby. I'll inform them, but I'm done with all that personal stuff. I'm going to concentrate on one thing, and that's making Lumia pay. If I'm supposed to be the Sword of the Jedi, then it's time I took it seriously, and there's nothing that's worth my time more than this. The duty captain of the guard came in later with a data pad on a bronzium platter and held it out to Luke. When he hesitated, Jaina took it and poured over it. The expression of I told you so on her face told Luke that it wasn't going to be comfortable news. You want the short version, Uncle Luke? Up to you. Mara shows up after Jason in 5 Alpha and asks Ops to keep an eye out for an orange spherical ship with cruciform masts, because our new chief of state might be under threat. Luke always tried not to be swayed by circumstantial evidence, because two and two frequently proved to add up to anything but four but he didn't know if they'd find any other evidence. He didn't know if they'd ever find Mara's body, or even if she'd left mortal remains. He couldn't ignore this. Jaina, he said, I think you have to leave this to me. What was it you said about none of us thinking straight? I don't want anyone acting on half the facts. What's it going to take, then? She's... She was my wife. I insist that I handle this myself. You shouldn't have to. I want to. Don't take this from me. Jaina actually flinched. Luke didn't think he'd snapped at her. Maybe his pain was so intense that the sudden burst of it then had touched her in the force. Okay, uncle she said quietly. But you just say the word, and I'll be there. There was still no sign of Jason by the time Luke had tried unsuccessfully to sleep for six hours. He'd dropped off the charts, as Jaina put it, and Ben had not reappeared. Ben, at least, had good reason. The search for Five Alpha resumed early in the morning. Caldabe Mandalore 
the fourth Besu leak off the production line rolled out of the hangar to meet the scrutiny of a small crowd of silent, armored men. They'd folded their arms in that typical, go on amaze me Mondo way. But as soon as the fighter came alive and sent dust pluming with its downdraft, they all applauded and yelled, Oya! Yes, they thought it was okay. Fett watched it with a certain pride. The higher frequencies in its drives made his sinuses tingle. Who says defense procurement drags its feet? said Medrit. He didn't seem bothered by the noise, even minus his helmet. But then blacksmiths had often been deafened by their trade. Record time. Only another half a million of these, Fett said. And we'll be in business. It's never about numbers, Mondalore. Never was. There was something about the fighter its effortless hover and tilt, combined with the distinct throbbing note of its propulsion, that made it exceptionally attractive. Fett doubted if it would have looked quite so pretty if it was pounding your city to molten slag. He planned to claim the offer of a test flight. Mandalore was resurgent, as Bevin liked to say, and it was gathering pace. A steady stream of Mandalorians was returning from Diaspora. A few hundred thousand in a week was nothing for a trillion-body city planet like Coruscant, but Mandalore was now creaking with the influx. You'd think a big empty planet like this could cope with a few immigrants, Fett said. Poor infrastructure. Medrit craned his neck to watch another Besulik take off. Got to fix that. Four million was always a nice stable population, until the crab boys messed everything up. How many incomers? Worst scenario. Impossible to tell. But you asked for two million to come back, and I dare say we'll get that. Fett still marveled at the ability of people to uproot themselves, but then Mondo Ade were traditionally nomads. And even he was happier in Slave One than with a roof over his head. I'm always touched when people do things without my needing to hang them out of windows. Sometimes, said Medrit, you have only to ask. Go read the Racial Nare. The six basic tenets of being a Mondo. One is to rally to the Mandalore when called. Handy, said Fett. But it doesn't always happen. Fett had begun to see the recurring parallels between Mandalore the world and Mandalore the leader, and why the two terms had become synonymous in the outside world. He'd always called himself a figurehead, a reminder of what Mandalorians seemed to think they should be, social template as well as someone to hang the blame on. But it came true. He was recovering, and so was the nation. Mandalore seemed to move inversely to the rest of the galaxy, which was busy going down the tubes and ripping itself apart yet again. But that was good for business, if you sold arms and military skills, so the correlation was expected. Time to celebrate, Medrit said. A little, anyway. Come on, everyone's heading to the Tapcalf. First round's on you. As he walked, Fett reflected that he was as close to satisfied with life as he'd been in a long time except for the few nagging loose ends that had loomed large when he was dying, and still hadn't gone away. One of them was Jason Solo. It always came down to Jedi and their schisms in the end. It's true, I tell you. She's been murdered. Bevin was holding court in the Oyubat, a tap-calf that drew a sweet, sticky Natra Gal 
and never ran out of Narcolithi. Big search going on in the Hapen Cluster. Serious trouble. Fett visited the calf once a week, partly because Myrta said it was good for morale, but mainly because Bevin asked him to. Fett wanted Bevin to succeed him, even if most expected him to groom Myrta. Cabinet in session, then, he said. The chieftains and neighbors who drank here had become Fett's cabinet, and if there was any serious attempt at government going on, Mondoade regarded that as a deeply unhealthy and aruatic thing, then it would only be tolerated over a boucher gall in the tap calf. Welcome to the Foreign Affairs Committee, said Bevin. Mara Skywalker's missing. Presumed dead. How do they know she's dead if the body disappears in a puff of smoke? Carrot muttered. He was playing a four-way board game with Medrit, Denua, and Myrta that used short-handled stabbing blades. Fett watched from the sidelines, never able to work out the rules. They do that, don't they? Fett thought of his lightsaber collection. Sometimes. Carid, using his helmet on the floor as a footrest, winked. So where's the forensics? Denua stabbed her blade into the board, and there was a murmur of, Kondosi. They sense it all in the Force. I joke, but I hear their son has gone missing, too. Carid tutted loudly. What kind of parents are these Jedi? Fett wouldn't have traded places with any of the Solos or Skywalkers. They were a tragically unhappy dynasty. And even if sympathy was something nobody paid him to have, he understood the loss of a parent. And a child. Any mention of Jason Solo? He asked. That name has cropped up. There's a surprise. Mentions of a Lumia, too. Alias Shira Bree. Now there was a name from Fett's past. Some things never went away. It all ran better under Vader. I'm still wanting justice for my mama, Myrta said quietly. Because if nobody else can be bothered to slit Jason Solo's throat, I will. She hadn't mentioned that in a while. Everyone, everyone, was waiting to see what retribution Fett had devised for the Solo brat. The longer he waited, the more sadistically just they expected it to be. But Fett could see something different in Myrta's eyes. If her grandfather was the most efficiently brutal bounty hunter in the galaxy, why hadn't he brought her Jason Solo's hide? The Jedi were right about one thing. Raw anger was a poor basis for action. He'd teach her cold patience, the best legacy he could bequeath her. Medrit, said Fett, I want to send Han Solo a gift. Nice carbonite table. Proper Beskar crush gaunts, so he can throttle the life out of his vermin spawn. And maybe a couple of armor plates and a small blade. Gift wrapped? Signed, please kill your son before we have to? Just... With deepest sympathy. It was as deep as Fett could manage, anyway. It must have been terrible to have such a disappointment for a son. Hapes Cluster Luke thought it was prudent for Corin Horn to take over the Jedi Council in his absence. He wasn't sure he could trust himself. It all felt very academic, even on a good day and today was as far from one of those as he could imagine. 
but apart from the fact that he was now minus everything good in his heart except Ben, Luke felt like his old self for the first time in years. He felt clarity. He knew what he had to do, and there were no gray areas or ambiguities about who was right and who was wrong. For all his pain, the sense of clean focus gave him something to cling to. And old voices called to him. He cruised the transitory mists in the stealth axe, wondering if it had been a phantom effect of the region's ionization and sensor-scrambling phenomena that had guided him here. He magnified his presence in the force again. The calm alert broke his concentration for a moment. "'Luke,' said Corin's voice, "'this is kind of hard to ignore. Everyone's getting anxious to saddle up and lend you a hand.' There's only one person I need to respond, my friend, and she's coming. But thanks. What do you mean, she's coming? Lumia. I can feel her strongly now. It's a trap, Luke. For me and her, then. She's making it too easy. Corin, don't worry about me. You know any one of us would gladly do it for you. I do. And that's why I have to. Lumia was here. Luke could feel her because she wanted him to. He knew that. He wondered how many times she'd passed by him unnoticed and undetected, and congratulated herself on her stealth. He thought of the hand offered to him after they last fought, and how he hadn't detected any ill will. That level of skilled deceit would have been impressive if he hadn't felt so sickeningly betrayed by it. Betrayed by his own gullibility. Mara used to say he bent over backward to see the good in everyone. I won't be trying too hard today, he whispered. In fact, not at all. He didn't even miss Mara right then. To miss someone... He had to accept that they were gone so he could yearn for them. Mara was still there, just frustratingly silent and unseen, and he dreaded the moment when he finally said to himself, Yes, she's gone. She's really gone. And she isn't going to walk through the doors and complain how crowded the sky lanes are these days. The transitory mists were bandit country, rife with piracy, and Luke didn't care. He maintained a steady circuit off Terraphon. Eventually, the feeling of someone darting through his peripheral vision became one of someone in the same room. He rotated the fighter 360 degrees in each plane, ignoring his sensors and his force senses for the moment, because he wanted to see this thing coming to look it in the eye and take in the entirety of it in the fundamental way of a grieving husband, not a Jedi Master. I knew you'd find time for me, he calmed. Had she heard him? His calm crackled. Lumia's voice had never aged. He hadn't noticed that before. I saw no point in running, Luke. Let's finish this. The ship was exactly as he'd imagined, rough-skinned, red-orange, so organic in appearance that it might have suited the Yuzhan Vong. The angular masts and webbed veins at its cardinal points lent it an edge of predatory grace. I had to make sure she died said Lumia. But you'll understand that, sooner or later. She didn't open fire, and the sphere didn't move. Luke considered taking one kill shot, but he'd done that before, and a pilot called Shira Bree had survived the appalling injuries he inflicted to become the cyborg facing him now. No. She had to die for good. The sphere rotated to face Terraphon, 
and began to pick up speed, on a straight course for the planet. Luke set off in pursuit, and the two ships accelerated, pushing their sublight limits in what Luke started to feel was a crash dive. Oh no, Lumia, you don't get away with a suicide run. You're mine. He stayed within his thoughts. He had next to nothing to say to her now. The sphere was streaking ahead of him, pulling away. He hung on it, closing the gap, calculating how long he had to intercept before it hit the upper atmosphere and plummeted to the surface, robbing him of every closure he needed. And justice. Don't forget that. It's about paying the price for Mara's life. The Stealth X edged nearer its manual's recommended safe velocity. Luke brought the fighter alongside the sphere, dipping one set of wings in warning to make it clear he'd intercept her. Maybe she didn't realize that he had tractor capability. She would now. Luke dropped back behind her, and applied enough traction to slow her and get her attention. He could have sworn something protested. It was the ship, complaining deep in his mind about the rough handling. Lumia seemed to get the idea and decelerated. Luke broke contact before they hit atmosphere and followed her down, buzzing her to force her to land on a flat-topped mesa overlooking a typically spacious Hapen-style city nestling among trees and vast gardens. He jumped out of the cockpit and waited for her to leave the safety of her vessel, standing with his lightsaber in both hands. Eventually an opening formed in the side of the sphere, and she emerged. Would the ship attack him as it had Mara? It made no move. He couldn't even feel it now. Come on, Luke. Try to finish the job. Mara would have wanted that, yes? Lumia reached up to her face and tore away the veil that covered everything but her eyes. Then she reached behind her back and slowly drew out her light whip. And this isn't to make you feel shame for the extent of my injuries. I just want you to see who you're fighting. I'm seeing. Luke drew his lightsaber, and temporary comfort flooded him. And this ends here. He knew the light whip by now. He'd relied on the Shoto as an extra weapon in the past to counter the whip's twin elements of matter and energy, but he was flooded with a new confidence that he could take her with just the lightsaber that had always stood between him and darkness. Holding it two-handed over his head, he rotated it slowly, stalking around her. Lumia raised her arm to flick the whip and get the momentum of the forward stroke, and then she cracked it, sending forks of dark energy crackling into the ground at his feet, making him jump back before he sprang forward again and brought the lightsaber around in a right-to-left arc that she parried with the whip's handle. He leapt out of range of the whirling tails again and again. Then she paused, and he edged closer again. "'You hate me that much?' he asked. I don't hate you at all. You killed her. You killed my Mara. Nothing personal. She looked as if she was smiling, but the movement was around her eyes rather than her cybernetic mouth. Just doing what I swore an oath to the Emperor to do. To serve the dark side... Oaths matter, Luke. They're all you're left with in the end. She drew back her arm and brought the light whip crackling through the air, missing Luke by centimeters. He lunged at her again and again, driven back each time. She'd slow sooner or later. But so would he. Then, 
As she began to raise her arm again, he ran at her, so close in that she couldn't get the whip traveling at its maximum lethal speed. He forced her back, step by step, as she tried to maintain the distance she needed. One, two, three, four. She blocked him, handle held this way, then that, using the whip like a short lightsaber to deflect him. But Luke didn't pause or shift direction to wrong foot her. He drove her like a battering ram toward the edge of the mesa, pushing her within meters, then a step of the edge. Lumia held the whip handle in both hands like a staff and blocked his downward sweep. For a moment they were locked in a stalemate, pushing against each other and grunting with the effort, with only the sounds of exertion, because they had nothing left to say to each other. Her rear foot began to slide backward as she struggled for purchase. The edge of the mesa was cracked and fissured. The smooth, glittering stone began to crumble. Luke reached out and caught her hand as she fell, whip tumbling and bouncing down the steep rock face into oblivion. He leaned back, all his weight on his heels, knuckles clenched white with the strain of holding her weight, and for a second he wanted to see her face dwindling as she fell to her death, mouth open in a scream. But that wasn't the way to end this. I'd never let you fall, Luke said, and pulled her back to safety. As she straightened up, he looked her in the eyes, calm, eerily calm, and swung his lightsaber in a single decapitating arc. Now he could breathe again. Cavern, Stormwater Tunnels Ben sat in the tunnel with his mother for a long time, and that fact in itself was the start of his investigation. At first he deluded himself that she was in a deep healing trance, even though the Force never lied, and the void that had opened in it would have been felt and understood by every Jedi. He'd run straight to her side, through country he didn't know, and found her. He wanted to think she wasn't dead because she was there, still much as he'd last seen her, except for the blood and scrapes of a new fight. So he sat with her, waiting. He wanted to clean her face and make her beautiful again, but his G.A.G. training said not to remove evidence, not to tamper with a crime scene. Ben, the fourteen-year-old son, lost and grief-stricken, willed his mother just to be in a deep trance. Ben, the lieutenant, knew better, but didn't mention it to his child self, and was careful to note everything around him take hollow images, make notes of smells, sounds, and other ephemeral data, and begin to form a logical sequence that would tell him how his mother had met her death. He was still sitting there, taking in every pore of her skin and every speck of brick dust on her jacket, when he heard someone picking his way over debris toward him. He couldn't feel the person in the force, Hello, Jason, he said, and turned to look at him. Jason's mouth opened slightly while he stared first at Mara, a long, baffled stare, and then at Ben. He reached out his hand to him. It's okay, Ben. It's okay. We'll get whoever did this. I swear we will. Ben was still shut down, hiding his force presence. But Jason had found him. It was time to go to his father. He wanted to be with him now. Maybe the killing of his mother had left a mark in the force that Jason had followed. Ben considered the possibility that he was too upset to notice it himself. He made a careful note of it anyway. Chapter 23 Lawyers for former G.A. Chief of State Cal Omas have slammed the Justice Department for the delay in bringing charges against him. Omas, 
currently under house arrest, is said to be pressing for a public trial. A GAG spokesman said today that investigations were still ongoing. HNE News Bulletin The Oyubat, Kaldabe Mandalore Venku, Kadika, came up to Fet and Myrta in the tap calf and gestured over his shoulder. He says he'll do it, said Venku. He didn't want to tell you he could read the stone there and then, in case he couldn't. He hates disappointing people. The old man who'd come to stare at Fet with Kadika the other day walked slowly across the tap calf. He peeled off his gloves and held out a frail hand dappled with age. I can do it, he said. Let me hold the stone. Myrta looked hesitant, then took off the necklace to hand it to Fet. Your kith are by origin, then, Fet said. Mandalorians came from any number of species and planets, but adopting the culture didn't erase their genetic profiles. Saves me a journey. I know the planet. What's your price? Your peace of mind, Mandalore. Nobody should search in vain for the resting place of loved ones. Fat wasn't expecting that. The hand still held out in front of him was surprisingly steady. Fat held the heart of fire by its leather cord and lowered it into the man's palm before sitting down and trying to seem unconcerned. The old man folded his fingers around it and stood staring at his fist, his breathing slow and heavy. She was very unhappy, wasn't she? It was a good guess. It was inevitable, in fact. The old man probably said it to all the wounded and lonely souls he came across. Charlatans and con men relied on the reactions of others. Fett said nothing to help him take a lucky guess, and there was no expression to betray him. And she found it hard to ever trust another man. Fett still sat in silence, one boot on the chair. Sintas had never trusted anyone. Bounty hunters weren't the trusting kind. So it was a safe, easy deduction dressed up as revelation. Her worst days were when your daughter learned to talk and asked where Dada was. Fett was starting to tire of this. He shifted in his seat, ignoring the voice that whispered it was probably true. How would he know anyway? He couldn't verify it. He and Sintas had parted by then, and he saw nothing more of Aelin. Not until I saw her dead body. She thought you still cared when you recovered the hologram for her. Now that wasn't a guess. It was specific. And it was true. Fett didn't dare look at Myrta. The inn was absolutely silent. The popping and crackling of the tap calf's log fire sounded like battlefield explosions. She said you were far too young to know what you were doing. And you said you only needed to know that she was beautiful, that she was a terrific shot, and that you could trust her as much as you could trust any woman. Fett's scalp tightened and prickled. It was exactly what he'd said, and it was too stupid and juvenile a line for anyone to make up on the spot. No, he has to have information. He has to be putting on a show. He got the information from someone. But how? The man took a deep breath and hesitated before speaking again. 
You told her that you'd make Lenovar pay for what he did to her. And she tried to talk you out of it. It was too much for Fett. Enough. He thrust out his hand, palm up. So you can read the stone. Venku lowered his chin. Even without sight of the man's face, Fett knew the expression behind the visor was fearless and protective anger. The old Mondo took a gentler approach than his bodyguard. Just tell me what you want to know, he said. I know these things can be painful. Myrta didn't give Fett a chance to answer. It was just as well. He couldn't bring himself to say it. To onlookers, he was just being typically silent and surly. I want to know how she spent her last hours, Myrta said. I want to find her body. The old man put the heart of fire on the table while he removed his helmet. He had a fine-boned, thin face and a wispy beard that was whiter than his hair, which still showed traces of sandy blonde. He was sweating, picking up the memories and traces of time embedded in the stone's molecular structure seemed to be exhausting him. And he didn't have a Kifar facial tattoo. But then neither did Myrta, despite the fact that Aelin had embraced the Kifar culture completely. In some lines of work, a permanent identifying mark had its drawbacks. It doesn't give me the memories in order, said the veteran. It's all random, like flashbacks. I see images, hear sounds, smell aromas, and so on. Making sense of it isn't easy. He laid his helmet on the table and picked up the stone again, this time pressing it between both palms. Venku put a steadying hand on his shoulder, and Fat felt inexplicably uneasy. Do you want me to... Find acts of violence? Fett glanced at Myrta, not for agreement, but because he couldn't help it. Her brow was creased in a little frown, dry-eyed, focused. Not a pretty girl, but a good strong bone structure. You'll find plenty of that, she said. She was a bounty hunter. You're not in here, Myrta, said the old Mondo, eyes tight shut. She died before I was born. I want to know who killed her. There were a few more people now in the tap calf than there had been. Fett indicated the door with a jerk of his thumb. Out. I'll let you know when you can finish your drinks. I want to know who killed her, too. It's too long ago, but I want to know. She wore this all the time. The old man looked almost in pain, and Venku squeezed his shoulder. She was angry a lot of the time, scared, too. There are so many people passing through here. But I keep coming back to a chart of Feda, red skies, and someone she was following. Resada? Resoda? Myrta didn't blink. She seemed transfixed. Grandmama didn't tell anyone where she was going, or who she was hunting. The man opened his eyes and took a rasping breath. Feda. Whatever it was, it happened on Feda. He jerked back and stared at the stone. And she fought to hang on to this. She fought hard. Fett managed not to swallow. He was sure they'd all hear it. She lost. I want to know, said Myrta. Venku stepped in. 
He's had enough. Maybe later. He retrieved his helmet and tried to steer the old man away. Come on. I don't know about the when, the old man said, pulling from Venku's grasp. But I know it's Feda. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. He handed the stone back to Myrta, placing it in her cupped palms with both hands, as if it were a live fledgling. Fett had never been comfortable around that mystical kind of thing. He simply observed. It's okay, Myrta said. You've told me a lot, and I'm grateful. Let me buy you an ale. Maybe another day, Mare Adika, Venku said. But thank you. Myrta watched the door close. As she turned back to Fett, the door opened again, and disgruntled drinkers filtered back in, giving the two of them a wide berth. Well? Was he right, Babuir? Fett shrugged. It had shaken him, like all the painful memories that flooded back without his permission. On the nail. Well, we can follow that lead— Fett dreaded what else the old man had seen in the stone. Old man. He was only ten or maybe fifteen years older than Fett. I don't think I've ever been to Feda. The tap calf owner lined up fresh ales on the bar. I see you've met Kataka then, Mondalore. Yeah. Fascinating. The old man with him? Don't see him around much. Gotab, I think. I used to think that was Kataka's father, but apparently not. The name didn't mean a thing to Fett, but he filed it mentally under subjects to investigate later. Feda. He'd scour Slave One's databases, maybe hack into the Feda archives. Myrta was examining the stone closely. Must have cost every credit you had, Babuir. She passed the heart of fire to Fett, and he turned it over in his fingers, touching the carving on the edge. Only the most skilled cutter could facet the uncut stones without shattering them, let alone carve them. It's rare to find one with all the colors in it. They're usually red or orange, but the light ones with the whole rainbow, they cost. I saw a blue one once, Myrta said. I was sixteen. I couldn't afford a blue one. Fett could afford one now, any number of them, even the rarest of deep royal blue stones that showed their incredible range of multicolored fire only in bright sunlight but he no longer had a lover to give them to. It had been a very long time. Tell me something about Aelin, he said. Was she ever happy? Myrta chewed over the question. I don't think so. The only thing Fett knew about his own daughter, beside the people she'd killed and what she'd stolen, was that she had never been happy never called him Dodd, and that she'd taught Myrta to hate him. He still hadn't questioned the girl about that. The time never felt right. Were you ever happy? Myrta asked. Fett never considered if anyone wondered if he was happy or not. There seemed to be a blanket assumption that Boba Fett coasted along on a narrow path of dispassion, never angry, Never happy, never sad. I was happy as a kid, he said at last. I stopped being happy on Geonosis, and I never bothered trying again. But he'd been angry, all right, 
angry, grief-stricken, terrified, lonely, and hostile. He'd run through all the negative emotions at full intensity in those days after his father's death, crammed in the spaces between doing what he had to do to survive when he needed to be all cold logic. It was a switch he had to throw, off and on, off and on, until one day it didn't switch on again, and the pain was gone. So were the joy and the love. If he did what his dad wanted, it might come back. If he did an honorable job, and tried to at least understand the remnant of his own family, he stood a chance of recapturing some of what was ripped from him in that arena on Geonosis. Drink up, Babuir, Myrta said. I want to go and do some digging about Feda. Galactic Alliance warship Ocean, on station just beyond Corellian space. It's awfully good of you to join us, said Admiral Neoffel. Jason walked onto the bridge and tasted the mix of emotions around him, ranging from vague interest to nervousness. I was very sorry indeed to hear of your loss. Jason nodded politely. She sounded as if she really meant the condolence, but then she was pretty good at hitting the right note. He was visiting Ocean in his capacity of Chief of State to try out a little hearts and minds on a gathering of the various ally worlds. There was nothing like a meeting on a suitably mighty warship to show folks what was at stake. The Confederation was now planning a major push against the Core Worlds, intelligence suggested, so Jason hoped everyone was paying attention. Life was going on much as before. Recent days seemed to have been a lot of sweat for nothing. If he needed any more answers to Sith philosophical questions, he was on his own. Lumia had managed to commit suicide by Skywalker. Jason might not have been part of the Jedi Council, but the G.A.G. were very efficient interceptors of messages. Uncle Luke did it. He actually did it. Like my dad. You never know how far they'll go, do you? So, Jason said, Corellia seems to have been very quiet in my absence. They were waiting for your return. That push on the core looks imminent. They'd hate you to miss anything. Neoffel, annoyed or not about his extra day or so of absence, seemed to have an air about her of someone who was suddenly more comfortable with her new role, as if she'd taken advantage of his back being turned to forge fresh alliances and consolidate her power. It was almost like a fragrance. The aura that surrounded the love of power was something Jason knew very well indeed. The Triumvirate is still doing the day-to-day -day running of affairs, but I've got our intel folks and political analysts reading the signs about who might replace the dear departed Prime... She stopped abruptly, and this time she was genuinely rattled. He could feel it. I'm so sorry. That was grossly insensitive of me under the circumstances. It's okay. Maybe there was a gentler side to Neothel after all. If there was, he'd exploit it to the hilt. Can't tread on eggs and suspend all normal conversation about deaths. The best thing we can do to honor my aunt's memory is to win for her. Indeed. Mercana seems tense. We're past the deadline, yes? We're keeping a watching brief on that. Might well be Mandalorian psych tactics. Eight X-Wings on standby to keep the peace is the price of G.A. Harmony. On the other hand, if the Mandalorians do show up to support their Verpine allies by halting disputed production in their own inimitable way then at least we might get a very useful look at the capabilities of their new assault fighter. 
Some might think, he said quietly, that we'd prefer to see them attack Mercana than not. I never turn down intelligence, Colonel Solo. Very wise, Admiral Neothel. Jason wandered over to the bridge holochart that showed the entire Corellian theater. They still had a lot of ships. There was a limited action going on on the coreward side of the chart. It always struck Jason as over-detached to show real-time life-and-death struggles as charmingly aesthetic and silent graphics. Is this current? Yes, sir, said the officer of the watch. Updated once a minute. I think we're missing something, Lieutenant, Jason said, dipping his fingertip into the maze of light to make his point. Look, what you have here is actually a flotilla of corvettes, and this destroyer here will move into this position because she's actually operating, uh... He trailed off aware of the raised eyebrows and puzzled looks he was getting, but bathed in the growing warmth of revelation. I can see all this. Can we check that out? The officer of the watch called to a colleague. Colonel Solo is rarely mistaken. Colonel Solo, Jason thought, had just had the epiphany of his life. It's true. Lumia was right. Oh, this is exquisite. I was blind before. How did I ever think I could succeed as a commander without this? Lumia had promised him a battlefield awareness and judgment that made ordinary battle meditation look like a finger-painting. To sense and coordinate by the power of his mind and will alone— a power that only came to fruition in the Master of the Sith. It's me. It really is. It was Mara's sacrifice after all. I accept that now. But I still don't understand the prophecy, and I don't like what I can't understand. He was a Sith Lord. Now his work could truly begin. It had happened, and it was beautiful. Jedi Council Shuttle, Hapes Cluster Luke was grateful for something he still couldn't understand. He paused before he walked through the doors to the compartment, taking a few deep breaths. Silgal looked up as he came in, and moved as if to leave. Mara, no, Mara's body, lay draped from the neck down in a plain white sheet on an examination table. Luke had steeled himself for something terrible, imagining her horribly disfigured, or her features contorted. But she simply looked as if she were sleeping on her back, pale and peaceful, her red hair smoothly tidy in a way it never was when he watched her as she slept. It's okay, Silgal, he said. I don't need to be alone with her. Oh, yes, you do, Luke, she said softly. And I can come back later. I don't understand it, he said. But I get to hold her one last time and I wondered if I ever would. I can't tell you how grateful I am. He couldn't see Silgal's face now. His eyes were hot and brimming. She patted his arm. You thought she would become discorporeal, she said. We talked about it once or twice. I thought she might choose that when the time came. I'm glad she changed her mind. She certainly made sure we had evidence. Silgal paused for a second, inhaled sharply, and started again. It was poison, 
one I've never seen before. But don't doubt that she also wanted you to be able to say goodbye. Silgal turned and hurried out. Luke couldn't speak or even look away from Mara, and he spent a long time staring into her face. If her eyes had opened and she'd asked how long she'd overslept, he wouldn't have been surprised. He lifted the sheet to clasp her left hand, and it was just the chill that made him flinch. After a while, the skin felt warm from the heat of his own body. Silgal needed forensic evidence for the record. But Lumia had killed Mara, and Lumia had paid the price. There was no investigation to follow. Yet that meant there was no need for Mara to remain now. And Luke was torn between wanting never to take his eyes from her and recalling how Yoda became one with the Force. Then he might really see her again. But he understood so little of those elements of mysticism. Right then, he was grateful to settle for watching her. You really did want to see me, didn't you? He whispered and leaned over to kiss her. He wondered if she would vanish in the next instant. He didn't dare look away, and knew that it was only stopping him from accepting that she was gone. Even when he felt Ben walking toward the compartment and heard him walk softly across the deck, he didn't turn around. He reached out his left arm so Ben would walk up to him and accept the embrace while Luke watched over Mara. Hey, sweetheart, he said to her. It's Ben. I'm sorry you couldn't find me, Dad, he said. I just had to go to her and be there. It was the first time Luke had spoken to Ben since before Mara had left. It felt like the first time in ages, in fact. Luke tried to think about what it must have been like for Ben to stand guard over his mother's body, alone and scared, but he was still too mired in his own grief and shock. Dad, I know she's telling us something. I've been thinking about it all the way back. Poor kid. Luke didn't quite understand what he meant, but they could talk it through later. He was proud of his son's strength and dignity. Ben could take the other news, too. He did a man's job now. Anyway, I got Lumia. Yeah? Ben sounded surprised. What do you mean, got? I killed her. I won't dress it up. I owed it to Mara to give her justice. Ben was totally silent. Luke felt a small disturbance around him, and his muscles stiffened. Dad? I know, legal process and all that. But legal process... Lumia said she had to. Well, a life for a life. That's all. Dad. Dad, it wasn't Lumia. It was. She said. What exactly had Lumia said? No, no, it can't be. Because I was right next to her at the moment Mom died, nowhere near the scene. We'd landed on Cavan, both of us. She was still in the Sith Sphere. Luke heard Ben's voice from a long way away and everything was upended again. It wasn't her. It wasn't Lumia. Dad, take it easy, okay? We'll find who did it. Ben grabbed his shoulders. Dad, that's why Mom stayed. She stayed so we could find evidence. We don't know who did it yet. Forget about Lumia. You just got to her first. I was going after her before Mom died. You did the galaxy a necessary service. No, he hadn't. Luke didn't feel he had done that at all. 
he'd killed Lumia, evil as she was, for something she hadn't done. That wasn't justice. Luke found himself sinking to his knees. I killed the wrong... Sith! I killed the wrong person. But she said... Ben put his hands on either side of his father's face, suddenly years older than Luke. Look at me, Dad. It's not good to do this here. Let's talk elsewhere. Ben, what about all the other people she killed and had killed? She's not worth your anguish, Dad. Save your tears for Mom, cause I will. Luke managed to hang on for a few more minutes. When he couldn't stand it any longer, he strode off to his cabin, shut the hatch, and sobbed and raged in private until he was spent. He'd thought he was bearing up well, holding in all those tears. And then something like Lumia added a straw to the scales, and the floodgates opened. He hated her for that. He'd wanted to weep for Mara, his grief untainted by anything connected with the evil that had led to her death. He didn't want Lumia intruding in this moment, and yet somehow she had. Whoever had killed Mara was still around. He could focus on bringing them to justice, and that meant he had something else to hang on to while he struggled with grief. But Lumia had done it again. She'd fooled him one last time, manipulated him one last time, thwarted him one last time. And it broke something deep, deep inside him. Chapter 24 Message to Hapen Fleet Ops Originating Station, Terraphon Unregistered and unidentified ship notified to us by Jedi Master Skywalker has been removed without authorization from Tuana City. Please advise Master Skywalker that we regret this act of theft while the vessel was in our jurisdiction, and will meet any claim for compensation. Mandal Motors Landing Strip, Kaldabe, Mandalore Boba Fett meshed his fingers to push his gloves back tight on his hands and looked up at the open cockpit of the Besulik. Under his visor, he allowed himself an intensely private, broad grin. Bevin applauded, laughing. Mondo boys on tour! Come on, Bobica, take that jetpack off before you get in, or you'll have a nasty involuntary ejection at altitude. Spirits were high. Fett hadn't led a Mandalorian strike force since the Vongese War, as far as he could recall. There might have been others, but that was the big one. The one that counted. There were cheers of, Oya Manda! as Besulik prototype fighters were rolled out from the hangar. People were taking holo recordings and pointing out the finer points of the airframe to their kids. The mood around Fett felt like a heady blend of nostalgia and optimism for the future, which was perhaps inappropriate, considering that they were about to violate Mercana sovereign territory, only temporarily, of course, and bomb a couple of its factory complexes into hut space. It was all being done considerately. He'd made a point of sending a warning to factory staff and residents in the likely blast zone to evacuate well in advance. It wasn't as if the Mondo flight was sneaking in and hammering them without decent notice. Mondo Ade weren't savages, after all. Well, not recently. And only to Vongese if they were. Besides... Fett wanted decent HNE coverage of the new fighter in action. It was worth an armored division in terms of deterrent. There was nothing sloppier than finishing an engagement before the media had a chance to set up and record it. Dad would have loved this. Fett was due to be the last pilot to embark, so he watched the other pilots getting into their cockpits. Bevin had been looking forward to this like a kid before a birthday. Medrit lifted up their grandchildren, 
Schalk and Brila, so the kids could slap their handprints on the fuselage in paint. It was a discreet light gray, although Schalk insisted a good Verdish blood red shade would have been heaps and heaps better. Babuir, called Myrta. Hey, hang on! Pare Sol! Fett turned. Myrta was running across the field, data pad clutched in her hand, and Orade ran with her. Either she thought Babuir was so senile that he wasn't capable of returning alive from a simple bombing raid in the hardest fighter on the market, or she wanted to do something unforgivably sentimental. He braced for mild embarrassment. But she didn't look like she was about to have a sentimental moment. She looked distraught. Fett automatically did a quick scan around the crowd to make sure everyone else whose survival mattered to him was still there and in one piece. Myrta was clearly bearing bad news that couldn't wait. Ah, oh, well. It happens. Babuir, she panted. I want you to be really calm about this. Fett said nothing, and just pointed to his visor. I'm not sure how to tell you this. She brandished the data pad as if she wanted to show she had evidence, and that she wasn't kidding. It's... I don't know. Spit it out. You know I started going through the Feta stuff. Yeah. I did a search of all the archive material for names like Resada and Resoda. Fett could see he was going to have to drag it out of her a grunt at a time. Yeah. Rezodar. Gangster. Dead gangster, in fact. Died around thirty-eight years ago. That's the name stored in the Heart of Fire. Fett noted Orade looking at Myrta as if he was more worried about her than about Fett's wrath for once. That's going to be a significant date, I assume. It is. I found he had an outstanding estate, which is what Feta calls leaving stuff of value without a will or anyone to claim it. The state can't claim it, so they store it. The state lawyer's really annoyed about still having to store stuff, and he says if we want to file a claim, he'll be a happier man. It'll take some time. Fett wasn't sure that the news of a very dead scumbag's leavings was worth interrupting his Besulik moment. But Myrta wasn't the drama queen kind. This had to be something about Sintas's death that would make him very, very focused. She'd worked out that he'd been touchy and then some about slights to Sintas, even if he had left her. Myrta, Fett said firmly. He rarely used her name. Just tell me the seriously bad bit. She handed him the data pad. The screen was already set to show images of what was stored in Rezodar's lockup, all numbered by the Inheritance Court Division. Fett thumbed through them. Just look for the carbonite slab, Babuir. Fett didn't like the sound of that. When he got to it, he couldn't quite make out the contours, so he magnified the image. Oh, Fearfeck. He wanted to blurt out something, but no sound came anyway, and nobody was any the wiser with a man in a helmet. His legs threatened to give way. He handed the data pad back to her, taking a deep, slow breath to try to control the tremor in his guts. What do you need from me to get this released? Fett was sure his voice was shaking. Credits? Signature? Is that it? Myrta demanded. Just tell me. It can't be true. It can't be. I can do it myself. 
she looked hurt, which wasn't easy for a hard-faced girl like that. A thousand credits. I'll pay. Fett could hardly believe the words that were coming out of his mouth, all in the voice of a calm stranger. She was... She's my ex-wife, after all. Sintas was alive. Sintas Vel, his first and only wife, was alive, provided nothing had gone wrong with the carbonite process. She was going to have quite a bit of catching up to do with the galaxy, and her shattered family. Aelin, what can I say? Okay. Myrta was all sour grit again. Play the hard man in front of your bourgeoisie. But I know you by now. Fett had decided to visit the refresher before the sortie. Now was a very good time. I bet you do. He strode off, same as ever, because that was what everyone expected. Then shut the refresher doors and leaned his back against the wall. He slid all the way down it and squatted there, head in his hands, shaking. Sintas was alive. He waited a few minutes, then got to his feet and walked out onto the landing strip to join his Besulik as if nothing had happened. Captain's Day Cabin, SSD Anakin Solo I see it now. I know what I loved most, and what had to be killed. Jason had laid on his bunk for hours, trying to slot the last piece into the puzzle that tormented him. It was the prophecy. It didn't fit. He will immortalize his love. It was only when Jason considered that he might not refer to himself, that he started down a complex path that showed the prophecy in its multifaceted complexity. It didn't just have one meaning. It had many. And this is why I'm now Lord of the Sith. There'd been no pyrotechnics, and no cataclysmic shift in the Force, and yet from where he stood now, Jason looked back and saw a landscape that had changed utterly. It had changed footstep by footstep, act by act, death by death. A change so gradual and incremental that he hardly noticed its passage until... Until now. He wasn't the same Jason Solo who was shocked when Lumia had told him he was destined to be a Sith Lord. If he looked back far enough, Jason saw its beginnings in Verger's oddly concerned avian eyes as he suffered physical torment that had changed him forever, showing him that there was nothing he couldn't endure and pass beyond if his will wanted it and he'd killed not a person he loved, but something precious whose absence he was going to find very hard to handle. It was already searing a hole in him. It had mattered, and it still had the appearance of being alive, but it was walking dead. What he'd loved and yet killed was Ben's admiration and devotion to him. Jason had grown to love that adulation, and he had loved robbing Luke of the role of adored father and mentor. He will immortalize his love, where immortalize means dead. And Ben. He knew Ben well enough to realize that he would never rest until his beloved mother's killer was caught and that she would always be that perfect icon of beauty and courage to him. Ben's love's immortal now. It'll last as long as he lives, 
unchanging, like his vision of Mara, and like the hatred and vengeance he'll feel for me when he learns what I did. That'll live forever, too. Jason got up and looked at his reflection in the mirror on the bulkhead again. He'd studied it as if looking for changing symptoms, hour by hour, to see if his Sith status were manifesting itself in his flesh. He didn't look any different. But he kept seeing Ben's face as he walked up to the boy in that tunnel and found him keeping vigil over his dead mother. His eyes. They knew something was waiting to be revealed. Something that would rip him apart. Mara made Ben start wondering why she didn't become one with the Force. Sooner or later he'll find out. You played your part in my destiny, Mara. And when Ben finally found out that it was Jason who'd killed her, he'd hate him more than he could even begin to imagine. Jason had injected a slow poison into Ben's love for him, as surely as he'd poisoned his mother, and seeded a terrible and wonderful hatred. A Sith needed that magnificent well of loathing to achieve greatness. Ben would eventually become greater than his Jedi father could ever be. In the meantime, Jason's war continued, now on the wider political stage as well as in the G.A.G. He picked up the black G.A.G. helmet that he rarely wore, rotated it between his fingers, and felt an odd queasiness in his gut as he put it on. It was standard G.A.G. trooper issue, flared jaw section with a dispersal gas-proof filter, the visor a single shallow V-band of toughened duraplast, just a basic tool of the job. It wasn't much different from the functional helmet troops had worn for decades. But I don't need this. Do I? He stood in front of the polished durasteel bulkhead. The black outline in front of him was smeared and hazy, a mere impressionist suggestion of what he was. He could hardly look. He was everything his enemies said he was. He was embarrassed. Yes, the embarrassment overshadowed any guilt. He had killed, and killed again, and killed Mara Jade Skywalker, who was both family and friend. Friends. Now he had none left except Tenel Ka and Alana, and they would come to hate him when the truth was known. I've sunk as low as I can in the eyes of ordinary people. But now, the only direction is... up. Jason thought of a brief conversation with one of the G.A.G. troops, a former police officer from the Coruscant Security Force. Most murders, the officer had said, were committed by family and close friends. The random killing of strangers was relatively rare even in the seediest quarters of the violent, lawless lower levels. I'm not so unusual, then. Jason took a breath and stepped two strides sideways. He was now looking into the mirror, set into the bulkhead of his day cabin, again. Crystal clear, sharp, merciless. He gazed at an image of all-encompassing black. He knew what people said behind his back, that he was trying to emulate Vader. So, I'm proud of my grandfather, but not blind to the weaknesses that brought him down. But that was wounded pride speaking. I have to be beyond that now. He had to be beyond fear of small consciences, 
and even beyond the hatred that would make Ben Skywalker a strong, worthy, and terrifying successor to the title of Dark Lord. But that would be years in the future. Now was the time for a man who'd once been Jason Solo to shoulder that responsibility for the galaxy's sake. Jason took off the helmet, looked into his own eyes, and didn't flinch. Kydus, he said, My name is Darth Kydus. End of Star Wars Legacy of the Force Sacrifice Book 5 by Karen Travis